welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy, and this is of particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. Speaking of Patreons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So, a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Fiber Oats, Bogey, Michael Kahn, Sarah Griffiths, Rob H, Ben White, Maximum Gravy, John Kays, Tommy Swagnets, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Will Brax, Mel B. Styles, Troy Shuker, Bo's Nail, Maris, Harry Blade, Mobile Max 777, Neo the One, Lost Cut FE, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Muted, Maria Neelands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, The Real Gabster, Liam Nedrick Jr., Abraham Mohammed, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Texas Mike, and David Wayne Foster. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now I will hand over, or we will hand over, to whoever is in Discord and Google while I set up for today's live show. Take it from there and go slow. Look at everything. Morning. 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 Some nice scratchy mics we got going on. Is that you, Steve? Yeah, I should. Yeah. Good morning, Nathan. You hear me? Okay. Yeah, you you got a mic that's all scratchy though. Hey Neil. How are you? Mighty fine. Can you hear Pretty me? Good. Yeah. Hello? Hello. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Neil. Can you not hear us? Yeah, I hear you now. Hey, Tenth. Good morning. Good morning. I think they're paranoid in this building now. Yeah, they. Oh, you're working again. They say they're smelling gas, and we have to. What's that? I say you're working again. Yeah, and the same. You got to evacuate. They're smelling gas. I'm like, come on. Well, that could just be a worker. Well, it went awfully quiet. It is awful quiet. So, do you remember I had a whole stack of broken amplifiers? Well, I've, uh, I remember you talking about it, yeah. Well, <laughs> just a bit. Well, I've sold them all. Um, really? Yeah, not only have I sold them all broken, I've developed slightly more than I spent replacing them on working amplifiers. <laughs> so, oh, broke, because of the because of the brand and the quality, the brand. I'll say I'll give you that much. Yeah, the branding. Yes. Well, that's good then. It's good, and it, it amazes me how much money I've wasted over the years. Because now I've looked at pro audio equipment, it's a totally different ball game. The quality's better. The standards that they're built to are higher. The tolerances are better. Just everything about them is better, and they cost a fraction of the money that a domestic one will cost. Further to that, the connection type is vastly superior on Pro Audio. It's XLR rather than single-ended phono, RCA. So everything about them is better, 
And like I say, I've replaced two domestic, no, three domestic audio amps with two studio amps. And it's cost less for the studio amps than it did that I raised for the broken ones that were domestic <laughs> ones. Isn't that nuts? <laughs> well, it, it's like uh, people who buy old cars in bad condition and then they have in their mind the restored version. So someone looking at these amps is realizing what what they were at the time, the the name that you know, the brand, and then they're starting their journey of restoration almost like a hobby, but they need it and they have to buy it broken. And so to them it's it's a win. And for you it's a win because you got rid of them. <laughs> yeah, well just in the way there's a distinct lack of space here. So you know things like old amplifiers knocking around aren't is not just not good. So I needed to get rid of them quickly so they're not, you know, potential so they don't trip make... hazard for kids and things. So they don't make handy footstools, I say. <laughs> yeah, they make handy paperweights. One of them is actually <laughs> functioning. I just couldn't be bothered to test it because it had a, like a dozen or more inputs and outputs on this integrated amp. You know, you've got all the different inputs for tape and radio and cd and phono and the phono's got two different inputs for moving magnet and moving coil it's got pre-ins it's got power outs it's got all these different connections now it works but i'm like it's two hours minimum work two hours i don't have to test it to sell it as fun as a functioning item so when i sod that i'll just sell it as broken say so, yeah i haven't tested it just be honest i haven't tested it Worked last time I turned it on, which is true, which is only about a fortnight ago. So it's definitely working as far as I'm concerned. But it's like, I can't, can't be asked with the aggravation of one little minor thing being broken on it and then someone going, oh, I want this much money off because it was sold as working. I'm like, no, sold as broken. Bye-bye. <laughs> Go away, big hunk of metal. Yeah. There's no, no questions when it's sold as, as is. Yeah, spares or repair, they have it listed as in, in eBay. But yeah, that's what I've done. Spares or repair. Yes, it's functioning, but I've replaced it and I've got redundancy. You know what I mean? I've got I've got an extra two yeah. channels built into the amps that are on the rack. So if something blows up, there's two more channels there ready to be used. So I'm never going to have any downtime, or at least that's the idea. Um, so I don't need surplus amps lying around that could be fixed. I just don't need it in my life. Sounds like sounds like you've uh... what's the word. You had an affinity for that brand and the old and the way they were made. It sounds like you've now are in realizing that the new works is cheaper, better, and different. And it was okay to change. Yeah, absolutely. I kind of knew that because I, I skirted Pro Audio with one of the companies I worked for as a rep. So when I was selling this stuff, I was competing with Studio Gear. Now, granted, the stuff I was selling was significantly better than that but i knew that i was you know competing with the best of the best against the studio standard stuff and it was better it never occurred to me that maybe the standard studio stuff was better than all the other domestic stuff you just don't know until you get one and try it and fiddle with it and test it and go yeah actually this is amazing it meets the specs that it's suggesting in the handbook and that means it's good and you can't really argue with it if it if it does what it's supposed to that's that's all it's supposed to do it doesn't really matter how many glitz and glamour, you know, publicity materials go along with it, really. Just chuck it on the shelf, and if it does its job, it does its job, and then you forget about it, right? Mm -hmm. I remember when I was younger, I worked at an audio shop as sales, and uh, all his kids were into the buy amp and all these different new, you know, radios and players. And, and then I got into home stereo in that store, and... People would come in, you know, just by the brand. They wanted Marantz or Sansui, one of those brands. And uh, then I'd do my homework, and the reps would come in and, you know, you know, tell us how to sell their products. And Hitachi had the lowest distortion. And so this one customer came in, and he says, look, uh, I'm looking for, and he went on, and I said, sounds like you're looking for something with the lowest distortion. I go to the rep of this company showed us this fact sheet and I played all the others, the Marantz, the Sansui, the Hitachi, as well as some others. He ended up buying the Hitachi, but he was dead set at first because he wanted a brand name. 
you know, that's how advertising works. Yeah, absolutely. Again, something you don't appreciate is that all the advertising and manpower and reps like me when I was doing it all costs quite a lot of money. And the scale for the people who are buying high-end domestic audio equipment is very small. There's lot, not a lot of customers. The, the scale of people who just want music and movies in their life, in their house, is massive. But they're, you know, they're buying little boxes from their local whatever you've got, I don't know, Circuit City or something over there. Oh, and that's they're, they're out of business, so it's Best Buy now. Best Buy, right. So you go to Best Buy, you buy an off-the-shelf, potentially expensive, right? A £1,000 off-the-shelf box of speakers and amps. You plug it up to your telly, and you plug it up to your streaming box, whatever that may be, or your computer, and, and you're away, right? That's that's most people. Well, that, that represents a reasonably good value for money. Then you move over to high-end domestic audio, and the value for money just, just disappears completely. Then you compare that to... What, how many musicians are out there that just need a good amp? And there's a huge number of them by comparison. And the people who are selling them, and there's a lot of them, because there's more people to buy them, are, there's obviously more competition. So they've got to be better and better and better when they're competing with other people who are getting cheaper and cheaper, selling on much bigger scales. So you compare it in terms of a value proposition and go, there is no comparison. You know, this just doesn't even come close, as far as I can tell. You get pro audio quality for... Like pennies on the dollar, just pennies on the pound. It's just nuts. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. enough from eulogizing. No, that about. makes sense. Go on. No, that makes sense because obviously the bigger market, more sales, uh, the standards are not the studio ones. But if you can have the best of that market uh, by just doing a little bit more, then that's that Hitachi guy telling me, hey, we got the lowest distortion of all these things that consumers want. So if you have a consumer that wants that, show them this chart. Yeah, but it's meaningless drivel because generally speaking, the distortion level of an amplifier, so long as it's below about 1%, you're never going to hear it. So there's other much more critical things, you know, how right, well right, the right. amplifier doubles its power into a into a doubling resistance. Well, well or halving resistance, I should say. Um, but that, that sort of thing people don't even look at. But see, that's that was the selling point because the the chart said it was like I spent a long time zero point zero five or zero point six or something like that was the Hitachi, and the other ones were higher. And even one percent, it showed on some of the others one point one one something. So that's all the guy needed to see, whether he right. could hear it or not. <laughs> yeah, you can't. I mean, generally speaking, most people's room is providing, by comparison, in percentage terms, 60% distortion. <laughs> now, if you say that to somebody, they just go, nah. You go, yeah. <laughs> the room's wrecking everything by such a massive margin. <laughs> it's untrue. <laughs> so you, you can get these 0.01% distortion figures off an amplifier, and you're like, who cares? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's yeah. basically meaningless <laughs> when you yeah, compare well, what actually comes out of the speakers in the room and what you hear. You know, that, that takes me to when uh, we went to the speaker room uh, for the cars and they had all the different car speakers on the board in front of you and one uh, car a radio CD player. And you say, you want to hear speakers one, two, and we had all these speakers. I can't remember how many, but it was over 10. And, uh, oh, I like the sound of that one. That's the one I want. So it's really whatever the guy liked, but it was done in that room. And of course, now in the car, it's going to sound different, sometimes better because it's in the door. How the hell am I going to get out? He's trapped, Neil. <laughs> What's wrong with people? It's New oh, York. Oh, dear. I saw that. That explains, that explains your attitude. It's New York. 20 point turn. No worries. Hey, one time that happened to me in the city. I'm in Brooklyn now. I waited for two and a half hours, and the guy that had blocked me in, it was an illegal spot, right against my bumper. I couldn't do anything. He comes after two and a half hours. I see him going in his car. I'm like, dude. He's like, whoa, I didn't even get a ticket. I said, are you serious? I'm here for almost three hours because I can't move. Oh, sorry. What a lovely story. Thanks for that. That was yeah, like kind of like an Asafold episode, wasn't it? 
It was in Friends. Oh, with the parking? Friends. Oh, it was in Friends? Yeah. Buys an MGB GT, parks it, and then some van blocks him in. So they spend God knows how long trying to pick up the car. <laughs> Move it. We'll just pick it up and slide it out. <laughs> Everybody, one, two, three. <laughs> no? Nobody remembers? I do. Uh, Classic. Not really. Classic. Classic 90s sitcom. Yes, indeed. Um, I think I only watched Friends a few times just because it was like shoved everywhere back in the 90s. I was, I think I like Seinfeld more. Like oh, Seinfeld? I know I like Seinfeld more. Oh, I hated Seinfeld. I used to like it. Oh, I hated it. Well, back Seinfeld. in the 90s. <laughs> I liked it back in the 90s. Seinfeld's basically like about 90s. psychopaths. It's about three psychopaths. Three yeah, monsters, you told me about basically. that. Correct. I joined, I joined late watching that show, like around season... Like the last season, I think I started watching that or something like that. Because everybody started talking about it at school, right? That's how I eventually... Did you ever hear but, uh... old Benjamin's take on that, Nathan? I did. Crazy, right? Well, he took the laugh track away. So he, yep. he, he studied the one about the soup kitchen. There's a guy that runs a soup kitchen and... Occasionally, he'll give people free bread. His prerogative, right? But the one main character doesn't get his free bread and starts moaning, so the guy kicks him out. He's like, get out. You know, my shop, my rules. So then the female character decides that because of this, she's going to ruin him. She's going to steal his recipe and threaten to open a competing business with his own recipe. Yeah, she does this to his face. <laughs> you know what I mean? They just monsters, but without the laugh track, which is the the point Owen Benjamin made. Very good point. It's a very different twist on it. If you don't have the laugh track to laugh along, ha ha! She's going to ruin his life. So it comes across as very dark, then, eh? Very dark when you remove the laugh track. I thought it was that way anyway. I never I tune out the laugh track most of the time. You know, I, I don't doubt that parts of Seinfeld and indeed Friends are in front of proper audiences. So the laugh tracks are real. I don't know about maybe not with Seinfeld in those particular scenes because a lot of them are in the street. Well, they're still set. I don't know. He, who knows if it's canned laughter or not? It doesn't matter. The point is that I, I will pay attention to the the context of a plot. And if it's dark like that, I'll just go, I don't like this and just tune out. And that was how I felt about Seinfeld. Right. Yeah, but Kramer was the Kramer was the really funny one. I used to love when Kramer just his entrance. He stole a lot from uh, Art Carney from the Honeymooners. He has like physical comedy. Another psychopath, absolutely devoid <laughs> of any empathy it, at all. Hold no empathy for his friends. No empathy for anybody around him. None. Just a hold complete on, psychopath. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Why? Because he had no job, but he always had money. No, because of the way he acted towards other people and their feelings. Correct. Didn't care. Had no empathy. It's comedy, you maniacs! Comedy! I never laughed. I never, that's, that's one of my... You watch a new show. My wife's into Netflix. Fair enough, she'll have TV crap on. And my standard is, do I laugh in the first ten minutes or not? Out loud. If not, then it's not funny. If you're not laughing, it ain't funny as far as I'm concerned. What about Simpsons? you got to admit Simpsons was funny. Simpsons will have you laughing out back loud occasionally. Yeah, of course. Yeah, back in the 90s. I don't know about Simpsons now, but back in the 90s, it was great. <laughs> what about got... Monty Python, Flying Circus? Of course. Makes you, you got... laugh out loud. Benny Hill. Benny Hill's... Uh, I don't know. I, I don't like Benny Hill. This is completely subjective. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, but it's a fun conversation to have, what, what we find humorous. Well, how about All in the Family back in the day? And no one would even dare show one of those episodes today. Humor is about leading people up with the, the lead line that give, gives you an impression that something's going to occur, and the punchline gives you a different outcome than you're expecting. So as an example, yesterday, I could just remember laughing out loud. What was I watching? Well, I was watching JLB. And he's discussing some riot somewhere. And it's in Bulgaria. Now, he happens to be in Bulgaria. So he's like, what I'll do, I don't speak that much Bulgarian, but I'm going to have a bash at translating what these people are saying to the newscaster. 
So the woman starts speaking in Bulgarian. He pauses. He says, and when he pauses, JLB narrates over the top, I don't like this. Then he presses play again. And she talks about something with documente or whatever she says. And he says, I don't like the fact that we have to do these documents. And then she speaks again and he says, I, uh, he narrates for her and says, I just want to go to the shops and not have any hassle, right? As he's saying that last line, I just want to go to... He's saying it in all sincerity, following along, and underneath, <laughs> he puts he puts in the Astons, <laughs> translation may or may not be completely made up. <laughs> As he's saying it in the most deadpan, dead serious, this is my genuine translation based on my loose knowledge of Bulgarian. No, it wasn't. He just completely made it up. But in the sincerity, you weren't expecting the <laughs> the undertiles or the subtitles <laughs> to say, I'm just making this up as I'm going along, basically, completely undermining his own video. But it was hysterical. I laughed out loud. Very funny. Speaking of John LeBon, I was in his, obviously in his stream the other day and somebody had pointed out to him that he's turning around to uh, observe anti-clockwise slash clockwise motion, north and south hemisphere assumption notwithstanding, was a win for him and it was pointed out that it wasn't. <laughs> he was like, I'm not sure I lost that argument, but somebody keeps pointing out that I have <laughs> one of my members because he's got his own website with memberships. <laughs> so he's, he's having this, yeah, yeah, it's relative, you're just turning around. That's been pointed out to me. Off the back of that, he's gone, I'd quite like to have a chit chat with you. I'd like a conversation, which isn't necessarily going to be a, a, a debate. It's not going to be anything like Charles Flat Earth Math getting a hammering for being a, a charlatan liar and a deceitful shit. It's more like just a chit chat with somebody who I actually like, which is JLB in this instance. So, um, with a bit of luck, uh, JLB will get in touch with me and I'll do a, what he calls a bonversation with him, which will probably go out to his members only, um, because it's my opportunity to talk about stuff I never get to talk about here. <laughs> and that'll be actually published to somebody. So, um, whether or not you get to see that on YouTube, I don't know. I doubt we'll get into conversations that will be published worthy on YouTube. Probably not. Any other JLB fans in? Yay, we all love JLB. Ah, oh, I thought you all would. I, I've seen some of his stuff. I remember he talked about, like, ancient Egypt. Do you still believe in ancient Egypt? I thought that was interesting. And He used to believe in ancient he Egypt. He, he <laughs> exposed the ancient history hoax in that regard. Is that what you mean? Um... Shows a load of wooden well, chairs least... being bought out of Tutankhamun's tomb. <laughs> You're like, hang on a second. How many thousand years old is this wooden chair? Wouldn't it be dust? <laughs> this looks like it's come out of a, uh... a terrible stage production back backstage. You know what I mean? Like dusty old props. That's what it looked like. He's just going, here's the photos That's of a... what they claim to have bought out of the tomb. Really? Right. He kind of did it like in that kind of tone, yeah. So he did more pieces of this, not just ancient in Egypt then, okay. Well, that's part of ancient Egypt, but I just remember seeing one episode and I thought it was good. Although he doesn't always get away with it, generally speaking, his tone is a sarcastic one, which is to say, right. in a deadpan tone, he'll tell you, for instance, what's going on in Bulgaria with that riot. And in a very deadpan way, he'll explain, without saying it, why you should consider it to be farcical and how he perceives it to be farcical. But what he's doing in a deadpan way is saying, I... Strictly speaking, as far as this narrative on YouTube is concerned, unspoken, agree completely. <laughs> That's what he kind of does. Right. Like with the ancient Egypt one I've seen, he, uh, hold on, waiting for the psycho. All right, that goes on. Right. So for the ancient Egypt one, and he's basically saying, look, these guys are claiming they found in the dumpster in the back of some alley all these manuscripts and like 90% of the ancient Egypt information we get from is from like these manuscripts that were all like in shredded tiny little pieces that they managed to put together. <laughs> and it, it sounds so ridiculous. Like, like, like you said, right. He points out how ridiculous it sounds. Oh, and yeah. then we just kind of believe it and go along with it. Oh yeah. So, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls was... story then. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I don't know if he did talk about that too, oh, but yeah. also that He's also is very that. ridiculous. Sure. 
yeah. I thought I've seen it from him, but I wasn't sure. But yeah, it's also a very ridiculous story. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's right. It's like it's official Christian narrative like you're, is... you're decrying there, you realize there? No, it, no, it doesn't affect the Christian narrative. Like, Yeah, it's, but, um, that is very much used in support of the Bible. Oh, well, did well, you not know that? We're supposed, to be, we're, supposed, we're supposed to be Dead led sea by scrolls. faith, not by sight. Oh, so just let me fill 10th in. Talking about Dead Sea Scrolls, 10th. We're supposed to be led by faith, not by sight, so we're not supposed to look through archaeology and all this stuff. So, and I'm yeah, but there's a claim. Stuff. I want to hear it. No, I want to hear the claim. There's a claim. I want to hear it. Well, your claim about the Dead Sea no, Scrolls but... is that they were found, what, in the 60s by some kid? And then a whole treasure trove of cornflake-looking books were found and put together to validate the Bible. That's the story. That's the narrative. It's no, not a claim. That's, that's the just narrative. their story. That's not. That's 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 not the narrative. It, the Isn't Qumran, the the, it's the Qumran caves, and a little shepherd boy was out, and he was throwing things or whatever, and it went through a hole of a cave, and he heard something break, and when it went there. And discovered there were these, uh, uh, you know, vases or whatever that were, had lids on them to protect whatever that was in them, something to that effect. So that all kinds of finds in the ancient world are found in caves or buried places. How is, so how now, is what's any of claim? what I said not what you just said, other than having a bit more padding? No, no, that's not. I'm not arguing that point. I'm just saying, what was the claim that you said would go against the Christian? faith well the claim in the first instance without causing which offense is. to christians which this absolutely will is beyond farcical what you've just described a little shepherd boy stumbling across thousand year old documents in jars if you buy yeah. that then fine but i don't okay so so in the ancient world people don't find things buried or hidden in caves is that what you're saying no, I'm saying the story of the Dead Sea Scrolls I find highly questionable. Okay, so assume assume it's that way, but assume it's also the way it was told. What's the point? What's the, What's point the claim about how, how, does that defeat, how does that defeat the Christian story? I don't understand. These are copies of the book of Isaiah that were word for word, that are a thousand years older than the current ones. We ah, there it is. How do you know that? Well, I didn't test them, but all the people who are in that field, even people who are against the Bible, but are archaeologists and like a Bart Ehrman, who verifies the person of Jesus Christ, verifies everything. I just says, I don't believe the supernatural part of it. So it would be like a, a critic of the Bible would verify it. But he wouldn't believe the supernatural part of it, but he still verified it. It's, and it's these not, are the people my, that have their hands on it. Is a very critical part of the history of the biblical text comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in the narrative, no, that's no, very, very, very recent. No, it doesn't. No, it's not a very critical part. They had the whole Old Testament. They have, I think, 26,000 copies, fragments of the New Testament alone. And they already had it going. And when Jesus was here, the Old Testament was already in you know, written in the scrolls in the synagogue. So that was already there. So we already have it. And when you find in 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 manuscripts, uh, and, and this goes back to when I researched it as a young kid, it, when you find something older than the thing you had, which was the oldest at the time, this is very important because now we can see if it changed. And when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they saw that the book of Isaiah was a thousand years older. And they said, okay, we'll see if there's any changes from the current version versus this one. And there wasn't. So they say. That's the story. Yeah, but the, that's, but that's, that's Nathan's that's, point, get, though. Well, but I'll that's Nathan's them. point. I know, but if it, they were never found, we still have the Bible. That's the point. It doesn't, it, it wasn't a missing thing. It's claimed to be the oldest, though, isn't it? At the current time that I researched, yes. Right. So the, the oldest descendant of this text suddenly gets set in the narrative in very, very recent history found by some shepherd boy that's the story okay that's fine so in? what of it no, hang let on, me hang jump on. in okay no hang on let me just go have I, I i'm still trying to figure out the significance of how it affects anything other than if if, if the story in other words he's saying how convenient 
Yeah, basically. Okay. You guys but, are both see, right in a sense. Yeah, okay. How, how convenient for a non-believer, but how convenient for a believer. Let's take both out. We already have it. Right. <laughs> yeah, but he, I think Nathan's just saying how convenient they find it. Oh, and it validates it. I understand what he's saying. Yes, yeah, sir. but it could also be true. And he's saying it could also be false. And I'm saying, okay, let's say the event never took place. We still have the Bible. But, okay, don't but, they, me, but don't they test that? Don't they, don't they test the, the age of it? Obviously. Yeah, but they also test moon rocks and all that stuff too. So Not that <laughs> way, righteous. Not that uh, way. It was, a well, special, let, it was a special group of people who were in that area. Uh, they were a sect well, that were separate of others, and they're the ones who buried it. There's a whole story about that. Well, Tim, well, I think I this. can answer this can guys, easily. Can you, guys, can you guys agree in archaeology is a ton and ton of fraud? What you guys all agree on that? Does it of fraud archaeology to the finding of dinosaurs? Yeah, all kinds of things right. in archaeology seems to be a lot. That's of fraud right. There's a ton of fraud. fraud. There's a, there's a ton of fraud with bankers. There's honest bankers. There's there's a ton of fraud with all kinds of things, but there's honest versions of them too. What's your exactly? Point? What's your point? Yeah. Either you accept well, it or I you just... don't. And I'm saying if you don't accept it, it doesn't change anything. Um, I, I would like to point out, too, that convenience has nothing to do with truth. Whether they found the Dead Sea Scrolls and Isaiah's whole book was a thousand years older than the oldest that we had, and they met, that doesn't change anything. All right. So, I, I, so non-believers will always say, how convenient. Oh, look at this. Yeah, of course. Okay, but have they done the study? Were they the critical... Uh, uh, um, what do you call those people? Hold on one second. I don't need that. Oh, you Hang on, Neil. I'm in the middle of a talk. I thought you stopped. I'm sorry. No. The, when, when, when it's the Bible, all the critics in all the universities in ancient manuscripts jump on it like bees on honey. Right. And they're so trying I to think find the holes. best way to look. I think Hold the best on. way to well, look I want to say I don't need that. Right, just, just take just, over my thought. I'm done, I guess. I guess you know when I'm done. All right. I apologize. I apologize, Stefan. No, hey, no, guys. Good morning. I wanted to ask you guys a question real quick. Hold Is on. it okay if I ask? Yeah. Um, have you guys heard of John Allegro? Because John Allegro is an important part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Have you guys heard about John Allegro? Okay. Before you get into John Allegro, I just want to say, I don't need that to encourage my faith. So... I agree with Tent. It doesn't mean anything. My question in a minute will be, how did the Jarrett survive entropy? Oh, man, the pre-show sure is getting really busy. <laughs> Everybody's trying to get something in. I've been trying to get something in, too. <laughs> how did the jaw survive entropy? <laughs> Let's have a flat earth debate. <laughs> John Allegro what, got what? kicked out. John Allegro got kicked out of the committee to decipher the Dead Sea Scrolls because of what he was he was um, deciphering it to say. He had a totally different view of what it was talking about. He talk, it was talking about a mushroom and the Anamita muscaria mushroom. So he, he wrote books on it, and he got kicked out of the committee, and he got, like, oh, yeah, blackmailed right. blackballed okay, from the Catholic priest. Okay. Yeah, look up John Allegro. If you don't guys, know about him, guys, you don't know about guys, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Have, hello. Can we not have the same yeah, as we had yesterday? Neil, just chanted straight through the middle of him. I was trying to listen to him, and all I'm hearing is, oh, here we go. I thought you were starting helpful. the show. It's not helpful. I thought you were starting the show. I'm freaking sorry. Who gives a shit about John Allegro? <laughs> Go on. Uh, it's it, if it's the truth, it we, give a, we do give a shit about the truth. Oh, I'm sure you want it to be true, Brian. It's not like that, Neil. Whatever it's no, true, no, they, it's true. This is this is a this is a place where everything about Christianity from the time of Christ is going to be challenged and attacked, and we welcome it. We welcome it. It's going to stand the test of time. I'm not worried about it. It's not about that. It's about truth. That's what I'm saying, Brian. Right, that's what I'm saying. Right, it doesn't saying. matter what the belief is. Hello. What? That's what I'm saying. Are we Brian? talking that's... about a flat Earth again? No. So what not. if it's true? What flat if Earth. it's true about Isaiah, Brian? Hello. Oh, Can we talk about oh, flat Earth today? This is the show that we're on. We always are challenging what they tell us about space and Earth, and this is oh, we all seek the truth, and that's why Jesus said, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life." I have no fear of the truth, Brian. Not.
Welcome to Class Earth Debate Live. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy, and this is of particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcomed back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. One last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. Now we are joined by Arwin, Tenth Man, Brian's Logic, Refracted Curvature, Neil and a whole bunch of people in Discord. So welcome, one and all. Hello, John and Armgro. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> We've been pondering our way through about one housekeeping question a day as it stands so <laughs> given that we've covered the first two and the last one we'll start with any evidence of the r value earth radius no but jesus is real oh, no, no evidence of man Stop. I'm there's just no evidence kidding. of the r value there is no evidence well, of the r value the but there's a lot sorry one second there is no evidence of the R value, but there's a lot of people who continually, even present day, right, assert it within their claims. That's correct. Well, the uh, R value um, would be debunked by the fact that it's being measured from a flat plane. You don't have flat planes on spheres. That's right. Yes, the sextant, the sextant destroys the R value. That's right, John. If it's a big enough sphere, you'll have some flat places, no? No, that's wrong. Eratosthenes. What do you mean? The guy said it the other day. There are no flat level surfaces on a sphere, Neil. According to what that guy said the other day, if you with the with the little rice kernels. And you get a big <laughs> enough sphere? What do you mean? It could be flat. So, Neil, a circle of equal altitude with a radius of, say, 4,000 miles, is it flat there? Come back. The bottom line is there is no way of acquiring an elevation angle from a curved surface. That would be a sphere Earth. Now, to measure an angle in any respect, they're going to need an elevation angle. That's a flat baseline. So, as... John pointed out at the start of this discussion, they can't do that. They can never acquire an elevation angle from a curved surface. Therefore, the first step for a globe believer in this regard, using a sextant, is to assume Earth's flat to measure the angle first. No sphere, no curved adjacent, no 8 inch per mile drop. Earth is flat. This proves it. Which would make heliocentrism an anti-flat Earth religion. Correct. That imagery that we see all the time with the sphere is really a circle. And it's and we're looking at it top down. And this is the trick that the ballers fall for. They think that the orthographic views of a sphere. I got That's issues right. with those pictures we look at. Because you are making a small little globe, let's be fair, and then you've got these two straight lines teeter-tottering. Well, Earth is a lot bigger than that. That's all they're trying to say from what I gather from who I was talking to last night. What he was trying to say was, we don't know how big Earth is, and if it's ginormous, 
But then again, I told him then, but everything in the sky relies on your 3959, so that goes out the window. But what he's trying to say is, if it's so big and we don't know it, then it's going to be flat. Yeah, Wait a minute. Wait. So, so what they're doing, this is a concession. So what Neil's explaining is the anti-flat earth in this instance is saying, look, if I can make my ball big enough, it'll be flat. So essentially, the globe believer is fighting with you to tell you how flat he's going to make his world precisely it's a concession because it has to be flat in order for them to gain an angle measurement in the first place so what are they going to do tell you well my sphere is big enough to be flat so big enough to be flat so to be flat is what we need in this instance that's the bit you focus on not his denial of how he's going to get to flat because his sphere is so big it's going to get to being flat isn't it neil at the end of this argument for him the yeah, sphere believer exactly what he's doing yes absolutely so he needs it to be flat, and he's trying to excuse how big his ball is, which will never be flat. But he's got to argue that it's flat first. Right, Neil? So he's telling you just how flat it is. And it matters not how curved the adjacent is. If it is curved, you cannot acquire an angle. That's correct. It must be flat for this to work. There's no... Well, obviously, I'll assume a sphere like I do in every other argument we've ever had ever. In this case, I'm going to justify just how flat it is first. Yeah, that's what they're telling us. Because they must. Well, they, yeah, but then they, they got to throw out 3959. Remember uh, Mr. Sensible telling Mitchell, at best, all you've done, right, is disprove the radius of the Earth. Well, that They can't do that. They can't they do that. <laughs> yeah, so they have to lie, like Charles Flat Earth Math lied. We don't need R. No, you can't have R when you're measuring a flat plane to acquire an elevation angle. It must be flat. That doesn't mean you don't assume R. It means you can't assume R and now you must lie about needing it in the first instance. Yeah, you can't have it when you're measuring a flat plane, which is what you do when you measure an angle. So not being able to use your assumption of R isn't the same as not needing R. You definitely need R. You just can't use it when you measure an angle. So Earth as a sphere is debunked. Earth is obviously, observably, measurably and navigatably flat. Yeah, they keep debunking it themselves. Well, they're telling us how flat it's got to be. Well, nobody says the, the Earth underneath the mountain is curved, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that was Highlander. Yeah. When we ask them, why hasn't it got a curved surface beneath this measurement? They will tell us, anti-flat earthers, nobody's claiming it's going to be curved when that's the basic premise well, of a sphere earth belief. Well, why would it be curved? Why would I be using a curved surface? Hello, because you're on a ball? Oh, where's Wally? Are you measuring an elevation angle, flat baseline? Oh, yeah, of course I'm measuring a flat baseline. I'm measuring it on earth. It, 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 what's worse again is they'll turn around to, after just telling you uh, that the ball could be so big that it would appear flat, then they'll tell you the distances travelled by airplanes or ships or some nonsense prove it's a globe. They'll yeah. try and throw in distances that are based on their globe, which is a 3959 radius. Exactly. So at that point that the guy's saying it's so big you can appear flat because I need it to be to measure this angle, you can say no, because you know the maths inside out and back to front, Neil. No, according to you, at 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height in feet, we should see a geometric physical limitation to our view to block boats and buildings. That's Earth curve. 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height would put the obstruction at 1.2 miles if you're a foot off the deck. Well, that's not a big, massive, I can't see it, it's so flat. It's You get down to a foot and a mile away, the curve of the Earth appears at the horizon. Yeah, we've debunked that, though, haven't we? Yeah, when you tell them that, though... Then they're not understanding that. I, I asked them about that, and I said, but what about all the stars and the celestial movements? It all is tied into 3959. You can't just make it bigger anyway, and then that's true. We don't have no drop anywhere. Any evidence of the distance to the sun? Um, if, if you want to assert that within a heliocentric model, you'll need an angle measurement. First. Oops, oops. That's a good point. So, <laughs> to assert R, uh, when they insert it, which we already knew, 
they'll take the angle measurement, which we already declared without realising how, how devastating this implication is. Their angle measurement's taken off a flat plane. They then insert R after the measurement. All right, that's what we pointed out in Red Rhetoric's video. So shout out to Smokescreen Design, who was the first to highlight this. Here's them measuring the angles, and here's them inserting R after they've measured a flat plane. Well, they uh, needed to Aratosth be flat. Eratosthenes did the same thing with his uh, radial measurement. He measured a flat plane and then asserted that the parallel angles of the sun rays, <laughs> that they were parallel on a flat plane. John, what did you expect them to do? He had to do that. He had to measure it flat because it's flat. Does anybody else get the impression that this is going to be that silver bullet flat earth proof where the silver bullet globe death came from the black swan? This is basically the equivalent, but as a proof of flat earth. This is amazing. It's just the best proof ever. I agree. We were asked back in the day, what's the silver no, bullet then if you're claiming the earth's not a sphere? What's the debunking? What's the silver bullet debunking? Well, the sphere is claimed to be geometrically limited by the sphere edge horizon called earth curve edge well earth curve lays at 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height and we can show that it's beyond that by a massive margin therefore it's not a physical geometric sphere edge hence they have to tell us it's refracted that's the end of the geometry so that is the silver bullet in terms of that's the end of the claim for a globe earth you need earth curve it's the thing you're claiming to prove that it's a globe if you haven't got it anymore you haven't got any proof then you come to well how do you prove it's flat then how is it not a dodecahedron? Well, it's not a dodecahedron because, number one, you'd have a physical geometric limitation to your view if it was. Like if it's a sphere. If it's any shape, you're going to have a limitation to your view. Whereas what we actually deal with is a horizontal plane. We acquire elevation angles. Sea level. Level. It's flat. That's how we deal with it. It, the clues are everywhere, actually. Uh, when Andrew Thomas Young says all his refraction studies were done on a plane, he pretty much said it there. Adam. Uh, all I, get is guys. I get a high Adam for that one. Yeah, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was right. They were all disclaiming it. This is just we didn't realise. Every time they took an angle measurement, like I say, back in 2014 or 15, when Smokescreen Designs pulling apart Red Rhetoric's address to Geronism, and saying, here's him inserting a presuppositional R value after making an angle measurement. Well, if we'd have known then what we knew now, we'd have said, so he's proved it's flat first then. We didn't. We just said, ah, oh, you're begging the question of R then. And to be perfectly blunt, no offence to smokescreen design, he didn't even point that out. He didn't realise the implication of assuming R and inserting it at that point. He was just pointing out that you can do the same measurement on a flat plane. But they're making the same so, measurement as we are. So therefore, they're measuring a flat plane too. Before they beg the question, they've got to measure it flat. It's just that wasn't overtly stated. So is it safe to say that the Beatles were flat earthers with the here, there and everywhere? Um, no. No. Morning, guys. Hey, Chuck. Uh, some, something is a, a, that's interesting as uh, R is debunked. Um, there's a lot of paradoxes tied up with heliocentrism that um, are solved by it being falsified, like the Fermi paradox. So what? Take, take us through the Fermi paradox again. You did go through this the other day, Neil. You were here. I didn't there hear what you said. There are millions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. If life happens the way uh, evolutionary biology tells us it does, then why do we not see civilization in these other stars? Answer, because the other stars aren't other worlds in a sky vacuum. A la the heliocentric model this paradox is based on. Without the model, there is no paradox anymore. Yeah, we debunked the model, right? Can't have gas pressure out of containers. Space is fake. Precisely. 
Uh, there's a black hole paradox where it talks about um, how you uh, measure a system. Uh, it's a Stephen Hawking's is the one that come up with it, but it was based within the heliocentric universe as well. So that one's debunked. Uh, the GZK paradox is debunked by that. I got a whole list of them. Hold on just a minute. You want to come back to it? Because Brian's got something up presenting. And then we'll maybe come back to it, unless you've got it at hand. John? You want to go through this, Brian? Sydney plus 12.71 positive east. I assume that's uh, Yeah, time. one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One moment now. What this is about, Nathan, is... Uh... Actually, could you give me a moment on this? Yeah. Yeah, please. I'll put, just put, I'll put the live audience on hold. <laughs> I just okay, want to know why you're I'll looking for it. I wasn't, on, expecting you to, to, I wasn't expecting you to share it now. Uh, why why are you looking for it? I'll give you a little count. This morning, I get up very early in the morning. I turn on my sports radio. And I heard within the first hour over 50, 50, count them, references to on the planet, in space, rocket ships, and just a bunch of heliocentric nonsense. For the first hour, 50 times I counted. And I wasn't even really paying attention. Amazing. Yeah, sure it does sound like sports. It sounds like... <laughs> no, we're saturated with it. It's, it's true. We're saturated with heliocentrism. Well, sports does have a ball normally in most sports, right? That was for you, Chocolate. The problem with that statement, Neil, was the first statement. I woke up and turned on the radio. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying we're getting the people don't have a chance because they're getting indoctrinated everywhere they turn and they don't even realize it. Yep. Make the light big. Uh, Put it everywhere. I'll, I'll I'll fill in the time between John and uh, Brian. The ninety degree that you must minus is a right angle. So the sextant and all the operations talk about the zenith. Uh, so that's a 90 degree. The observer zenith is a 90 degree. The GP of the star or sun or moon is a 90 degree, if you're going to bring that down as a GP. That could happen only on a flat plane. So 90 degrees, every time you see that and I'm seeing it all over the place in the books I bought and the PDFs I read, videos I watch. Oh, minus this from 90. Subtract this from 90. You got to take no more than 90. That's the maximum altitude is 90. That's just crying of a flat surface. Has to be. You can't get it on the curve of chase in a 90 degree. Shh, don't mention 90. I'm, I'm ready. Sorry. Go ahead, Brian. I'm ready when you are. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready to go. Uh, I, I make it quick. <clears throat> yeah, this is about magnetic declination. As it's been currently, uh, uh, currently uh, in my chat, in my comment section, by a lot of the globe side, it's been denied. They're saying it doesn't change the distances between two locations. So how can you change the actual um, direction of a location? but not change its distance between that and another location. So I just put this out here, right? Remember, this is, me this is measured in degrees, right? So Sydney is plus 12.71 degree pos degrees positive east. Johannesburg is minus 18.97 degrees negative west. 12.71 added to 18.97 equals 31.68. 31.68 by 60 nautical miles equals 1900.8 nautical miles. 1900.8 nautical miles equals 2187.4 satchel miles. So according to magnetic declination, Sydney, Australia is 1900.8 nautical miles or 2187.4 statute miles further from Johannesburg than we are led to believe by the globe our model. Because they have no declination within their model. So they are denying that magnetic declination has really any purpose. That's basically what they've been denying in my uh, comment section. 
this is what they're at now because they have to because they're trying to support distances with air with air travel from one place to another or, or travel by ship. It's like yeah, but when we do, it's like the you know that claim where three three people, one in Australia, one in South Africa, one in South America, can look at the same star system at the same time. It's that they're trying to support basically those kind of claims. And the only way to support them is to play, pretend that magnetic declination, which is our only actual north, doesn't exist. I used to watch Anthony Riley pulling the anti flat earthers around by the short hairs of the side. It was very amusing. Well, uh, they have to deny everything now at this stage, it seems. Because everything has to be denied. Because I don't know how you can change the direction of somewhere and not change its distance to somewhere else. Uh, I really don't know how that's possible. Well, has anybody substantiated this claim? So when it came to this, you mentioned as an example, the star example. Well, someone put that to me once. I wasn't even familiar with the argument, but I was like, okay, show me. Show me that being the case. Because what they typically do, or did in that example, at least with me, was bring up a cartoon and show how they perceive this to be happening when they all claim to be seeing the same at the same time. You're like, okay, show it me then. Let's see that observation. Will they show it you? Will they suddenly produce this simultaneous observation? No, of course they won't. But they'll claim it with a little diagram and a cartoon. And again, in that particular instance with me, immediately held up in false dichotomy with how does it work on this disc? Well, I'm not claiming that disc. Yeah. This isn't yeah, my claim. Anthony's been asking for that for years. That's all shit. <laughs> Yeah, even before uh, I came across the declination argument, I had already pulled it apart. This is years ago. I had already pulled it apart based on the fact that it was purely based on ma on global mathematics. It was a purely global... It starts and ends with that. It can't have anything within that that are not global mathematics. That means perspective. That means reality. That means declination. That means everything. So it's just mathematic, a mathematical claim. It's like what they all like. All those claims are mathematically claimed. Every single one of them are mathematically so, so, claimed. So they're questioning distances based on a globe Earth model that was that's come from measurements of a flat plane. That's good. Yeah, basically. And that's what happens when you work from geometric considerations back to the source. Yeah, because the source is flat. Speaking of maths, any scientific evidence of gravity? You're all keen, super keen. Check it out. No, there's no evidence whatsoever for gravity. No evidence whatsoever. Oh. It's a mathematical description of something that doesn't exist. I like the silence better. Silence is definitely. Uh. Hey, Arwin. Yeah, I'm freaking sound is not working for some reason. Yeah. Now Google Plus is acting like Discord. Uh. <laughs> yeah, uh, Neil had the same problem. I think it's resolved itself for you at least. If you can hear me, that is. I could hear you. I just, no sound was coming through on my side. But uh, I, I just wanted to ask, well, what is gravity? You know? Bending of we a conceptual of something. bending of a space-time medium that doesn't exist. Well, what does that imply physically? Nothing. There is no physicality to time as a dimension. It's merely reified from the mathematics of Einstein, conjured in the mind's eye of Einstein, and only exists in maths. Well, if there's no substance to it, then how can you scientifically prove it? You can't. First, you've got to have a physical phenomena in reality to study, something occurring. So you can say, oh, look at that happening. I wonder what caused that. Well, when it comes to gravity, there is no phenomena. Bending a conceptual space-time medium, well, pseudo-Romanian for space-time, has got it in the title. It's pseudo. Mathematical description of a conceptual medium known as space-time. Conceptual. Well... Technically, it started off with a claim phenomena when there was a claimed apple that f fell onto Newton's head. <clears throat> different gravity. But it is a different gravity, but that's where the whole thing started. That is the support. That's the claimed start of gravity. So, I mean, you know, the fact that we can have a different gravity 
that re- that, that does that not say how much of a load of rubbish it is? <laughs> you can have a well, different you're one. You're still going to need a hypothesis. You can't have happen. a different electricity. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah exactly. Arwen's got the nail around the head. Even if they were to claim the original old and busted, as Chocolate describes it, Newtonian gravity in name only, more accurately described as Reverend John Michelle C.V. Boy's Cavendish gravity, well, that needs a phenomena also, and there isn't one. So what are you going to study scientifically for that gravity? Well, nothing. Their claim phenomena takes place in a man-made contraption devised by Cavendish. It doesn't take place in physical reality. Mass doesn't attract mass. The core of the apple uh, was destroyed by Pi. Also, uh, the Newtonian mechanics math, doesn't buddy? allow. They're going about the Newtonian sorry. maths. Sorry, it's Paul. That's uh, Paul. John. The Newtonian mathematics does not account for a non-inertial turning reference frame. Older bus is oh, 107 years apple. out of date. So. You know, I don't know why we're even talking about this other than the fact that the anti-flight earthers need to cling on to it because there's often a time that they could do with the force <laughs> to resolve some heliocentric issue and they haven't got one anymore. So they appeal to the 107-year-out-of-date old and busted Newtonian in name only, gravity. Harvin, that was a high-level pun. Can it core a apple? Oh, it can core a apple. I have a quick list of those paradoxes, four of them. Perfect. Let's have them. Uh, There is the GZK paradox that deals with cosmic rays, the Selinger's paradox. Hold on. One at a time. Hold on. Cosmic rays. Let's have that one. Oh, hold on a second. I'll have to pull it up. I was just giving the list of all the ones that are debunked. I can go back to them if you want. Oh, definitely. I'm sorry to put you to it, but yes, please. Uh, The Selinger's paradox. Olber's paradox, that's the photometric paradox. Wheeler's paradox of black hole entropy. The black hole information paradox, that's Hawking's paradox. The Eddington paradox. Uh, the faint young sun paradox. The heat death paradox. And then there is the red dwarf paradox. Oh, that sounds like a very stable model they got there. So what's the red dwarf paradox? Uh, Since the red dwarf star is the most numerous star in our sky uh, that we uh, can find exoplanets around, then why is our sun not a red dwarf star? Oh, I thought it was going to be, you know, about space, it's black. (laughs) You know, black hole, it's black. I thought it was going to be that paradox. Red dwarf paradox? I don't fully understand the paradox. No, that's the... In the heliocentric model, most stars are red dwarfs. Okay. So most of them are dying or... No, most stars... Go on. Most stars that have inhabitable uh, chances of life, right? Terra planets. I see. Terra... Gotcha, gotcha. So most stars with a Goldilocks zone are red dwarf stars. Therefore, why given that we have a Goldilocks zone within an inhabitable planet, aren't we orbiting a red dwarf? I see. That's another reason why we're an average-sized planet orbiting an average-sized star. You know, just one of those things to make it sound like we're less special or less favoured is that if we're orbiting a star, that's the wrong colour. Well, it's a it's a paradox built within a model, and the model's been falsified, so it, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah, but the isn't the whole a... idea of the different sun types and how that would supposedly go? Isn't that like really outdated? Isn't that like a mid twentieth century conception? Even no, no, that's current rhetoric. But like, uh, it's just that like, how do they even know it works like that? Or supposedly works like that, right? Except for, oh, we see the sun here. Oh, it's that color. Oh, we're just going to say it's a red dwarf or say it's the... Like, do they yeah, even have any that's kind their of job. testings? Astronomy. That uh, is their job. That's what they're paid to do. <sighs> yeah, body yeah. of science. Sorry. Owen, the body of science, you know? Astronomy. Uh, the body of science compels you. 
<laughs> Are you ready for the GGK? Uh... I do not feel very ah, compelled. Yeah, we're getting into paradoxes here. Yes, please, John. All right, the Grison Zetkin Kuzman limit, or the GZK limit, is a theoretical upper limit on the energy of cosmic ray photons traveling from our other galaxies through the intergalactic medium to our galaxy. The limit is 5 times 10 to the 19th EV, or about 8 joules. Uh, hold on a second, there's a bunch of unnecessary stuff there. Paradox. In the past, the apparent violation of the GZK limit has inspired cosmologists and theoretical physicists to suggest other ways to circumvent the limit. These theories propose that ultra high energy cosmic rays are produced near a galac galaxy or that Lorenz covariance is a violated in such a way that photons do not lose energy on their way to our galaxy. That sounds very ad hoc for their model that problem. Checks out. Okay, I see, well, I the see their problem. Is, how is... But, their, but their problem is a model based problem based on the assumption that you've got these massive bodies at these vast distances with now limited by the inverse square war, uh, law um, distance that the photons can travel. That's that's a problem within the model. Yeah, I see where you're debunking these one at a time. I love this, them. Brilliant. This, this one's a bit interesting. I'm, I'm trying to get my head around it. it. It seems as it's saying that the whole model is based on protons and how much energy and speed a proton can travel with. Except when they take the results, they realise that it's not protons. It has to be something heavier. So all the how do we know that the photon? Because all the the assumption is is all based on proton uh, numbers and maths to calculate everything. But when it comes out, it's, it it turns to poo. Um, so nothing's correct because the assumptions you've worked on, which are protons. They're not protons. So everything you've built around the mo in that model to get that limit, it busts the limit because they're not protons. Hence why it'll break the limit. But all your modeling is based on protons. So it's kind of useless. And how do we know? How do we know the power that they left the supposed source with that we can say that they arrived here without losing power? We don't, but their supposed source has a supposed distance that's presupposed based on a supposed R value that's been debunked. So everything within this model is folly. It's nonsense. It doesn't matter that there's a paradox within the model because the, the model isn't the world we're living in. Correct. The premise has been falsified. The question becomes nonsensical. Anybody been presented this model? No. Don't be silly. Ask oh, okay. anybody. Chocolate <laughs> I want to do with your thunder. Just lay it out as a, a piece of advice, a tip for fellow debaters on the circuit. Chocolate what they should ask for in this regard for an embarrassing answer. Yeah, ask them to give you their working model. Just once. Just tell them to present it to you. I've, I've only seen them demonstrate uh, what's it called Stellarium. And they claim that Stellarium is a fully working model of the heliocentric religion. Uh, uh, where in Stellarium do you have uh, gas pressure over there the container? Just what I was about to ask. And where is it? Perspective uh, taken into account. Can you show I'm me? Sorry, can you show me gravity in Stellarium, please? And the motor. That, that's, all, that, that, that's almost as good as when we were told. What was it that guy came and told us? The model is uh, timeanddate.com or something. Something like that. <laughs> Stellarium also has the stars underneath <laughs> your feet. No one ever observes the stars yeah. beneath their feet Correct. unless they're standing upside down. And what we were saying. Yeah, begs the question. Stellarium still shows the stars circling above your head. So you're on a flat surface and the stars circle above your head. And then there's also no parallax evident in the Stellarium stars. But then they must be at the same distance if they're all traveling together. But they claim that Stellarium was their model. And it's 100% proof because you can go forward 300 years and you can see when this star is going to line up with this one. And the textbook says that's right. So therefore, model is right. And the model has gravity in it, right? That's, that's no. the ephemeris. That's the nor ephemeris. gas pressure, nor anything else that would have to be included if it was a true model. 
That's the ephemeris. They knew what the stars were doing a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years in the past, and they'll know what it's doing the same amount in the future. That was all before Stellarium. I got a real complicated one. If y'all if are ready for another paradox. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to make one statement before John does that. That's about what John's doing. John's doing now. How that would be? The, how that would be explained away? by cosmology and whatever, and astrophysics, whatever else is. It's just science correcting itself. Science, there's no correcting empirical results based on experiment. Science proves things. Mm -hmm. So if you prove A causes B, you rule out A not causing B, it's discounted forever. Uh, so, this one no. right here is one for... Oh, but this one right here is one where uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity collide. It is the black hole information paradox. Oh, bro. And it is a combination. She's got to give his daughter a hand with the woodwork. She's soaring. Okay. <laughs> In the 1970s, Stephen Hawking found that an isolated black hole would emit radiation at a temperature controlled by its mass charge and angular momentum, but in a manner that was independent of the initial state of the black hole. If so, this would allow physical information to permanently disappear in a black hole, allowing physical, many physical states to evolve into the same state. However, this violates a core precept of both classical and quantum physics, that in principle, the state of a system at one point in time should determine its value at any other time. Specifically, in quantum mechanics, the state of the system is encoded by its wave function. Again, not a problem if you've got a non-existent model that we don't live in. They've named a black hole no. and given it certain properties and then found that that doesn't work within the information base. Well, where's the knower in this equation with the black hole? Why would it be the case that information is going to disappear down a black hole in the first place when information requires a knower for it to have existence in the first place and for that knower to distinguish a path of the information I have an influence over it, they've got to be in the equation. So when they talk about knowledge or information in this regard being sucked into a black hole, the, the notion it's based on itself is absolutely absurd when you look at quantum mechanics. So, from that perspective, their absurd model doesn't work with quantum mechanics. Yeah, and? And how could the radiation escape a black hole if nothing can escape the gravitational um, well that's created? Like, light can't even escape. Now, that's shown in Stellarium, escape? right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, they don't have a radiation function. Not yet. Look, this whole this whole bullshit notion of uh, spaghettification, event horizons, the um, point of no return when you get to a black hole, that this is all invented by Einstein. It's all bollocks. There's a black hole physical. Yeah, model. Yes. I've put the best response to black holes on screen for you to read, Nice. I can't read it. It's too small. Okay. Want me to do it? If that's yes, the please. case, if uh, black holes are physical, well, black holes are physical, how, if, if information is lost, so you a physical object to enter, it causes something that's non physical to disappear. It, uh, the description itself is a first law violation, but go ahead, Adam. You're right, Paul. Okay. It's completely nonsensical. Even when you've got deep space intergalactic mining ships with supercomputers, um, how are you supposed to spot these things is, is the issue. And generally, this is, I think, this is the best response. Because when Holly can't find it, oh, he's got, and she's getting in trouble. Well, the thing about a black hole, its main distinguishing feature is it's black. The thing about space, the colour of space, your basic space colour is it's black. So how are you supposed to see them? You can take 25 uh, uh, composites from 
various different parts of the world, colour correct them, composite them on top of each other, and Bob's your uncle. You've got a donut, and you can call it a black hole. You just need your polarised black hole spectacles. Didn't Einstein, what is it, John, please help me. Einstein, um, I can't remember what it was now, he spoke about how you can see them, um, according to him. Yeah, it has to do with the event horizon. The, the, I can't remember. The, the point of no return and like, nothing, light can't escape but can't escape. I thought I thought this was answered a long time ago. All you need is a computer and iTunes and some lunch. I uh, know we're talking about observations of non-physical, non-visible black holes against the backdrop of a black space. Yeah, and that's what I'm talking about. Them. That's, and when you do see the them, if you do see them, why would it be the case that you describe the occurrence that's described momentarily ago by Adam of light being sucked into them, creating a point of no return called an event horizon, where the light disappears into the black hole but simultaneously is also ejected out so we can see it that's what they describe i've seen visualizations of this actually just bonkers but either way that's what they're describing right how can they catch the word horizon horizon is a optical illusion where sky and ground meets where for them to call it an event horizon and it's occurring on a round black hole I think they're just trying to squish horizon into round objects now. Maybe. Well, our friend Becky sat at a computer, had lunch, and listened to iTunes and studied those things. That's how you find them. Uh, there's a relativity paradox. I think Jaron may have covered this one at one point in time. Right. Um, assuming that when uh, A shifts, uh, let's see, uh, this has to deal with uh, uh, action at a distance and the problems with it. Uh, and if uh, if the physical object moves, uh, then the tugging of the the instant it would instantaneously move. But the impulse would travel from the base to apex at a speed far less than that of light, namely the speed of elastic waves in the material. After the lapse of sufficient time, the two would uh, uniformly as a whole, and the mechanism provides a good illustration for the recognizable point moving much faster than light. The relativist does not object to this, since the motion of X does not then correspond to anything coming within the definition of a signal. The time of signaling from A to B must be reckoned from the moment A is given the impulse to the mechanism. Okay, so what you're saying is if you've got a row of marbles that's 20 million light years long and you push one marble, there's going to be a violation in their model of the speed that should not be violated because instantaneously at the other end of that row of marbles, the other one's going to move. And they're saying that when you study it, you've got an impulse, i.e. there's going to be amount of energy that slowly dissipates along the line rather than just instantaneously pushing the marble? Is that what you're saying, the paradox is? Mm, I would say not separate marbles. Um, I think Jaronism did an example where he said, if you had a broom that reached from Earth to Pluto, as I tug on the broom, broom handle in on Earth, the end of the broom will instantaneously move because it's all connected. Gotcha. Whereas... If it's marbles, it's still transmitting some kind of energy from one to the other to oh, gotcha, the other. Gotcha, gotcha. So you got it. You got shouldn't it. be able to Perfect. The light speed. Yeah, broom, broom handle. Got it. So it's something completely solid and very long, millions of light years long. You took one end while someone's holding it. There is no. It's instant, right? Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's based on speed of light, though, isn't it? What's the problem with that? Exactly. Well, because moving it. It's not there's moving no, at the there's speed only, light. It exceeds, speed uh, uh, exceeds the speed of light. That's only a problem no, in their model, though, isn't it, John? You can hear me saying that a lot, aren't light. you? What, what's exceeding the speed of light? The, the broom's just moving at the speed you pull it. But the information... Oh, obvious. The information has travelled faster than the speed of light. Is that the one-way speed? <laughs> Can you give me a two-way speed? 
<laughs> Can you give me a one way? <laughs> no, no, I'll just stick to asking you about two way speed. <laughs> I'm wondering why and this I think uh, that... beautiful working model that we're told every day is our existence has so many paradoxes coming from the same people that present the model. Hmm. It's a little funny style, if you ask me. Well, none of them are paradoxes anymore. I think that's John's point, right, John? I think well, I just destroyed that one. Explanations. What, what Adam's done is he's made a really good point, which no one's got an answer to, so everyone's ignored him completely. So what we've but done, Adam, I'm is we have wholesale it. ignored where there is no <laughs> violation of the speed of light because nothing is physically travelling beyond the speed that you took the broom. So, yes, would you like to take this victory dance now or later? Now I want I want to take Brian's point, which is, I think is another good point, Yeah, which this is all based on an assumption of the speed of light is being violated. Now, the only speed of light we have is the two-way speed of light. We've got no idea what the one-way speed is, and even if it is being violated in the in, in informational sense. It's just half the two-way speed of light. It's easy. Half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was going to say. Well, in that case, the one-way speed should only be like half the two-way speed. <laughs> What's the one-way speed? I knew I'd get to ask you eventually, Brian. <laughs> uh, uh, check me. You have to get me. You brought around this album. <laughs> That's the point. So has anything been violated? If you haven't confirmed the one-way speed of light, you don't know whether it has been violated or not. And if there is no speed of light so, with a speed, then so there's I nothing think, to violate at all. Exactly. I think the way that Geronism described it in his thing was that if there was a button on Pluto and say I pushed the broom handle, it would instantly turn that button on and that me deciding to turn the button on at Pluto would have covered more distance than could have been accomplished. So it was more like achieving a task with the broom that would mean that I've now achieved the task at faster than light speed. Shout out to Tony Whitcomb. He says, I've yet to hear someone say, oh, look, that plane orbiting around the Earth. Just saying. Thank you very much for the super chat, Tony. Also, <laughs> as, I've not had the information passed back to me yet, but... On a show that I ran when I just happened to be short a number of shows for that weekend because I've done a lot of edited videos, I put out a late show. And on that late show, which I can't remember the number of to look it up, uh, Neil dropped me a $200 super chat, which I was completely unaware of. So he's like, did you get my super chat? Now, there's me thinking, oh, maybe he's you know dropped me 20 bucks or something. I'm like, oh, thank you very much. Uh, how much was it? And he says, $200. I was like, geez, it would have been nice to have actually seen it fly by and give you a big thank you. But thank you, Neil, on a on a live show, as you didn't get any thanks at all um, for your monster super chat that I've still yet to see. I don't know which show it's on, but thank you all the same. Hey, it's okay. Are you believing something without evidence, Nathan? Yeah, I don't distrust Neil. Just kidding. No, on that paradox thing as well, um, you know, they said if you traveled at one light year or one, you traveled at the speed of light for one year away from Earth and you were a twin and you came back to Earth, that one of the twins would have aged by X amount of years. And then someone raised saying, how do you know which twin aged? Because technically, if it's relative, then the twin who stood still also was separated by just as much time and space. But they always claim that the one who remains on the Earth would be the same age, and the one who returns would be decades older. And that's also a paradox. If, they just, if you separate two objects and then bring them back together, how can you say one object is older than the other? Well, that's if time existed. Um... Isn't it? Indeed, it's a reification fallacy at its heart, right? Because you're developing this notion that we've used to detail how much the movement of the stars, shall we say, occurs in a given period. We've ascribed this to a mechanism in a clock and then reified it into how much that elapsed clock motion will be dictated to a person's cell destruction or cell degeneration or whatever the words are aging basically horse crap what a load of nonsense shout out to chris berry who's become a member for 15 months he says i'm no longer flat i'm a level surfacer well thank you for letting us know chris 
and thank you for joining. Their claim, this whole nonsense about uh, time dilation and whatever else, uh, from the relativity model, it's all, every single part of it is based around it not being debunked. What I mean by that is you'll never, the calculation for it would be so minute if you were dealing with, let's say, airline pilots or you're dealing with uh, what they claim to be astronauts, right? Because for, for it to have any effect mathematically, they'd need to be way, way further away and much longer. You know, this kind of thing. So that's why they could always claim when the astronauts supposedly came back from the moon or from wherever, the ISS, whatever nonsense they're claiming, or a pilot that has 30 years service in, that there's not going to be any visible change whatsoever. You know, so it's back to, we have absolutely zero evidence or proof for any of this nonsense, but this is the claim. And the claim Different is math. that dilation, you say? Or would that be the widening and largening of something? And that yes. is applicable as a suffix to time. So can you show me time dilating? Anybody at all? Well, well I can't. It's the claim is atomic I'm supposed to dilate a concept. Yeah. They say you place atomic clock, clocks in orbit or even just several hundred thousand feet above Earth and think it, synchronize it with a clock on Earth. And when they bring it down from the stratosphere, it somehow has either lost or gained time the by clock. just simply being separated from the first clock. The clock has. So in the most literal reification, they've put the timepiece they use to describe their concept up in a rocket. Oh, wow. So they're assessing this man-made technology then. It's nothing to do with <laughs> time. It's reified into physicality by these idiots. And everything to do with them putting a bit of technology on a rocket, you say. All right. All right. That, yeah, they haven't done anything to time. That's a concept. The clock, meanwhile, yeah, you can assess that for its validity based on the technological attributes that you may discover by doing such a thing, if useful. Uh, question, well, then. The decimal that, places would that, change. With, with that premise in mind, then, what's the time dilation that the people who are up on their RSS for a year or so, what do they suffer? What Who's a girl them? clock they... pregnant? <laughs> I've... I've heard them say that the ISS has, what, 20 sunsets and sunrises in a day or something every 90 minutes or has multiple sunsets and sunrises. So therefore, if that's how we age a person, then they've gained 10 years while being up there for one. Well, they have proof of that years. when they had the... Uh... <clears throat> they, they had proof of that when they had the Super Bowl winner before it was played, remember? So they had the jersey on. Well, no, they just must have well, sent a box up with every jersey, <laughs> just in case, you know, because it's not like it costs fuel to send up mass. Uh, they never went up, is the point. <laughs> All they have. I feel like when you re-upload this, this needs to have like a background with like Star Trek music, because that's what all of this crap sounds like. <laughs> Star Trek crap. I was trying to figure out a way of having Scotty delivering a stopwatch from a mechanical clock but i couldn't work it in quick enough well it uh, it, it started doesn't it as, as as being politely called paradoxes but they're all relating to quantum um astrology astronomy all of these made up things and the reality is to me is it's just highlighting that even within their own made up story it's not cohesive and it's nice to call it a paradox but it's just how your story falls apart even within its own construct is what I'm hearing. In, in yeah, paradox is a, is a nice word for mm. saying we don't know what the hell this is about. <laughs> no, it's a nicer we're, way we're of saying totally our, models, each other. our model's broken in this regard, so we'll yeah. call it a, a paradox. I mean, it's akin to saying, or me inventing the Narnia lamp paradox. How does the lamp keep burning? Where is it getting its fuel supply? How is it doing it when there's such a massive time dilation in Narnia? Well, 
that's not a paradox. You know, figuring out a problem, that's that's more like a continuity error, if you like, or a plot hole. Isn't it a... It's a plot hole. A hypothesis yeah. failure. It's a plot hole. H hypothesis failure. No, there's no hypothesis in this heliocentric model. What? It's a plot hole. Well, what what I was have... saying on the reason... Just quickly. Well, what I was saying on the reason say. I brought it up... Yeah, go ahead. Just want to stage before we get the point gets lost. I, I, I only because I tried three times to get this in. All they have to support their time dilation claim is a cesium decay rate. Now, how it has that to do with time, I don't know. Go on, John. I, I was just going to point out that all these paradoxes, you know, uh, are solved now. We have shown that we live on a flat plane. You can't measure R, the radius of Earth, from a flat plane. There is no physical geometric horizon, so you can't even enter into the worldview that allows you to even consider these paradoxes. Right. You're never going to go through the wardrobe to Narnia to concern yourself with the lamp paradox. Likewise, you're never going to stand on a spherical surface falling away from your position 8 inches per mile squared leaving you with no way of acquiring an elevation angle. Now, when the fundies on the sphere side assert that they are on a sphere, they first measure the flat plane we actually stand on and then insert their presupposition based on an R that has a geometric horizon, which we don't see in reality. So, as a consequence, all of these claim to be paradoxes, actually plot holes in a religious story have no meaning anymore. You need to concern yourself with the paradox of this black hole when there is no heliocentric sky vacuum world to concern yourself with the black holes that have been described at the distances they've given them. None of that is true. Therefore, the paradox isn't a paradox anymore. It's not that it's been solved. It was never a paradox to begin with. Well, yeah, I guess you could say that as well. Yeah, It was what we call a cool story. Cool story riddled with plot holes. Yeah, that's what makes it cool. Nah, plot holes well, aren't the cool. Premise, the premise that the paradox rests on that was accepted as truth has been disproven, so that's that's what I meant. Yep. Are we going to get a few more in the after show? Yeah, it, I got, a, I think, three more that I found. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll bring them up in the after show. That, I'll say if you are watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Primary Streams, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. Unfortunately, if you are watching this live, this is where we bid you farewell. So a huge, massive, enormous thank you to all of you who smashed the super chat, liked, commented, shared, subscribed, joined as a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member, smash the PayPal link and all that good stuff. I've been Nathan Oakley and I will see you all in the next video. <laughs>
this would be where we would be at in 2022. Not in a million years. Just couldn't believe this would be where we're at. I don't know if anybody else had the foresight to say, come 2020, your opponents will be demanding you accept how flat it is and denying that they even need our lying about its requirement. Would you have anticipated this would be the place we're at? Because I'm pretty I'm pretty happy about this. I don't know about you guys. I'm pretty happy where we're at at the moment. Yeah, usually that's a good point. Usually the opponent uh, sticks to their guns all the way to the end and they lay down their guns and say, okay, we're going to argue from your frame of reference instead of ours. Yeah, I, I don't have to assume that. Like I, I don't need it to be a sphere. I, I don't need that. Who's saying I need it to be R? I mean, Charles has literally done a couple of videos in recent times after me giving him a tongue lashing that says, do I really need to assume R? It's like, hello? Yeah, if you want to be on a sphere, you do. But no, you don't have to. It's I funny, right? Because all we've gotten oh, yeah. from them so far is uh, uh, who's claiming that it's curved? Who's claiming that it spins? Right? Who's claiming that the the the, the base of the mountains curves? Right? Like it's literally them asking us who's claiming their claims yeah, as they're yeah. claiming it. They're asking us. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, they're asking us. Who says we need R? Who's saying we need R? That's what they're asking us at the moment. You couldn't make this up. Nobody claims the horizon is geometric. That's what they are. Nobody the claims the horizon's the Earth curve. Part. We wouldn't expect to see physical geometry. These are all 2021, 2020 arguments, admittedly. Now, but now we're being told, you know, we're being asked, why would I need to assume R? Why would I think the ground beneath the mountain's curving? Of course I'm going to measure it flat. It's on Earth. That's what we're being told in 2022 by globe believers. I listened to Charles Flat Art Math. Um, he was on the Troy Thinking server last night. I listened to him talking with the lads over there. And they were trying to get him to define an X, X and Y, right, plane. You know, because you have X and Y, um, X, which is East Things, Y, which is North Things, and then you have Z, which is Zenith. And the only way, no matter what they did and how they asked him, eventually, the best they could get out of him was that he referenced a, uh, a vertical plane on a computer screen. He could not, would not reference a horizontal plane along just under or just on your kitchen floor wouldn't address it no matter what. It was making actually but people that are getting annoyed they wouldn't normally get annoyed. Back here. Yeah it's pretty it's bad. one of, it's one of those tactics, right? Like I heard that guy, I don't remember where he was, but there was something I ran across on the same time and somebody was asking him about uh, the tilt and why we don't see buildings tilting in the distance. And his question in response to the, to the flat earth asking him that is, well, how much tilt would you expect? Like that's the only response that he had. Not where is the tilt, not where, why is there no tilt? How much tilt would you expect? And the problem is the flat earther didn't say, well, I don't expect tilt because <laughs> I'm a flat earther. It's flat, there's not gonna be any tilt, but you think there is. So why the hell would you ask me how much tilt I would expect? And he just kept going with it with his, with his very nice way. Like, it just freaking annoyed the hell out of me. Just like these guys, man, with that. Uh, anyway. Well, when you cornered yeah, them, uh, they force you to prove the ball earth for you. It's like, you prove the ball no, 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 earth it's not then prove if the ball I'm not doing for you. a good it's enough job. prove they make the claim you've just debunked. You debunk R, and their response is... When did, I, when did I ever say I needed R? That's their response. Prove to me I say I need R. That's their response. So you debunk the Earth as a spinning sphere. They go, when did I ever say there'd be two inertial, one in non-inertial reference frames with Earth turning underneath the claim Coriolis deflection? When did I ever say that? That's their response. Isn't that a lot like when they throw it back on you and you say, I never made a claim, but when we ask them what it is, they say it's a sphere with a radius of 39.59, and it's all inclusive in that. So they made the claim already. Now you're saying, where is it? You're saying, I never made the claim. Yeah, you did, when you said it was a sphere with a radius of 39.59. Yeah, I wouldn't expect to see, I wouldn't expect to see any leaning of the buildings whatsoever. 
I wouldn't expect to see any of that. That's the answer to that. Because it, it's not a globe. We shouldn't expect exactly. to see ballers bringing evidence for their claims. Well, that's why the yeah, Earth curve maths were so important. It was the only uh, measurement they claimed that dealt with curvature at all. Remember the claim about boats going over the horizon? Well, back in 2015, I remember specifically arguing, as I told you before, I spent a lot of time on the water in the very small boats. What you see is a boat disappearing from the bottom up, and that is their official claim. But if the boat was going over something, what you would see is not what you see. You would see the back, you would see the front would dip down, right? And the last part you would see of it would be the back of it and a very tip, the very tip of its uh, sail or whatever, if it has anything up in the air, you know, if it, if it is a sailboat, the very tip of the top of the sail, that's what you would see. I remember arguing at this point with them and they, they didn't know what to do with it. Because that's what you would see if a boat was going over something. You look at a car going over well, a hill. You don't see the car disappearing from the bottom up. You don't. Well, well that's, that's your bad for thinking things uh, being affected on a ball would actually be on a ball. That's your bad, right? Yeah. You can't, you can't act like a ball. On, it's on a ball if it's on a ball. Why would right. you expect that? <laughs> the ball yeah, man, you the make ball it as flat as possible. model only works because the Earth is flat. How about Are that? You? I need to repeat myself. The ball no, Earth no, no, only no. works because the Earth is flat. Yeah, that's excellent. Oh or, any, or, any, or if yeah, a ship any, was uh, going magical? left to right, or if a ship was going okay. left to right, if it was on that sphere edge, the horizon, it would look like it's tilting away, like the mass would be tilted you know, pointing away from you. Exactly, that was my point. The last thing you would see of that, that sailboat would be the very back of it and the very tip of the top of the sail, because that's all you would be able to see over the top of the back that's about to disappear over the core. So that's what you would see. Well, when you watch a car go over a hill right in front of you, let's say San Francisco or something like that, did they see the wheels start to disappear, all four at the same time start to disappear from the bottom up, and then they just see, like, no wheels... Then there's no bonnets you know, or back, and then there's no top. That's not what happens. Car just drives over the hill. The last thing you see is the uh, the back of the car. Well, you could state that if you have large buildings with broad rooftops, some are like that, that over enough distance, you would be able to look right underneath the flat rooftop side. You would see underneath it from the side because the earth was a ball. Yeah, you're looking at it yeah, from the like <sighs> I've got to defend the ball now. I'm uh, just telling you what you would see if the Earth was a ball. If you're going to apply the ball mathematics, then the angle of tilt would be inconsequential in terms of what you could observe because you'd be dealing with something like 0 0.0142 degrees of tilt per mile. So even at 10 miles, you've only got 0.14. So possibly there, but very difficult to... To, to measure, and that's going to be in the z axis because the x and y is still fine, but that tilt's going to be occurring in there. I have to completely uh, disagree uh, with something. Go on, chocolate, I go after you said first. No, I was just going to say, see, the reasoning behind me bringing that up is not whether we can actually see the tilt or not, it's the clowns that think that uh, things are tilted away asking us why we would expect it to be that way. In reality, yes. that's the only point I brought it up. Right, because they don't well, understand my, geometry and the natural consequences. They don't have my, any spatial insight. My argument against that right, would be it's weird. there is no. It's weird second, that, if, sorry, if, that if it was a globe, that refraction would actually make everything flat then, you know? No, of course it does. A, no, yeah. no. Well, Their refraction is globe refraction 7 over 6 r in standard form when you say that statement it infers that the light bending will do that well light bending isn't globe refraction so you have to be careful when you're trying to demolish that assertion because you have to work within their original claim and ignore their bait and switch refraction 
isn't atmospheric refraction, otherwise known as terrestrial refraction, otherwise known as light bending through sphere-shaped air in maths. They're very different things. What I would say to what Adam said is he is correct in what he's saying concerning buildings. He's wrong uh, when it comes to the X and Y. There is no Y. You might have some X, but there is no Y on a curved surface. You can't have a core X and Y. You can't have a plane. The X and Y is a horizontal plane. It can only, uh, you need the Z then to change the elevations on the horizontal or across the horizontal plane. But if you're just talking X and Y, but, but if you're talking having an X and Y, you can't have that on a curved surface. And that doesn't change anything to do with the sailboat that's supposed to be going over the core three miles away. Ready for another paradox? Well, I was going to ask what I can tell the show. I have a question. Well, just before you get onto the next paradox or paradox or Brian's question, what can I call the show? So, ending paradoxes. Is paradoxes the right... Is that a word? You could call it Fermi Paradox. Uh, solid. The Globe Paradox. Flat. Yeah, Fermi Paradox solved. It's flat. Whatever the most famous paradox is, oh. it's probably that. Oh. Oh. Paradoxes debunk. Paradox, the paradox of non-existent paradoxes. I'm going to go with Black Hole Paradox. Ending the Black Hole Paradox. Anybody uh, okay. hey, Nate, think they live on a magical Nathan, spinning did. water ball and wants to tell us how these are not paradoxes? Maybe? Discord? Maybe? Hello? What are they going to do? Argue out? Hey, Nathan. It? it really is a big, massive problem. Oh. Yes, go ahead, John. The other John. Sorry. Yeah, this is sacred knowledge, actually. But anyway, I was wondering if you got any extra uh, listeners today, by chance, because last night, I don't know if any of you guys caught the Killer Priest podcast. With um, they had that dude Sanchez Sanchez on there. He's a flat earther. I don't uh, know if you guys heard no. about that. Anyways, I give you I give you a couple of shout outs on there last night. There's a lot of people listening, so I was I hope that you know maybe got a few people. But um, he went on there and and it was funny, man. The guys afterwards the way they they got all triggered and they started talking all sorts of smack, but they got shut down. They were you know they they didn't have any real arguments. It was the same old bubbles are round, so the earth has to be round, you know, like, but they were pissed because he, he schooled them all. <laughs> Who did? Sanchez. Cool. Bro, Bro Sanchez? Yeah, Sanchez. All right, okay, cool. I have to listen. What's the podcast called? Uh, Killer Priest. Oh, it's called Killer, Killer, Killer Priest. Priest. Um, I don't know the exact name, but he's one of the members, of, original members of the, of the Wu-Tang Clan. He has a podcast. He's from the Wu-Tang Clan. And he's a rapper, and uh, he, he's got a go pretty good podcast, but they yeah. talk a lot of Hevo-centric stuff, but also a lot of, like, just uh, esoteric stuff, and it was a pretty good show, actually. It was good. Yeah, I'll check it out for sure. As we're mentioning people going on other people's podcasts, did anyone catch that Mark Sargent had been on was Sean that? Atwood's podcast? No, I didn't know that. Well, you may not. He's a British okay. guy that was that was arrested for drug smuggling many years ago and spent a long time in American prisons, um, but has become a bit of a celebrity off the back of that. And just an interesting character that I follow. And then just suddenly Mark Sargent's chatting to him. I was like, wow. Okay, fair enough. Um, Can't get David away from Wise was on there. David Wise went on there once too. He he was, but they're funny. They're, they have, they're really new, new to Flat Earth. So, but yeah, they, he kind of broke them in. And now this guy went on there, he, but they got triggered. Like, the Killer Priest is more open now. He's, like, getting it. But the other dude is still on, because all they talk about is outer space shit, usually. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's funny. Going to be hard to let go. Nice to know, though. I mean, yeah. obviously, there's people like Neil out there that really need this to be spreading faster. So it's going to help. Can, can I make my statement? Yes, go ahead, Brian. You've been waiting ages. I didn't trigger Neil. Yeah. Unsuccessful. <laughs> He was too busy at work. Um, yeah, my statement's very simple. <clears throat> How can something disappear uniformly from the bottom up on a curved surface? Uh, that, that has a, a hidden gem in there. It means that it has to be flat if we ob uh, observe objects. If we observe objects disappearing uniformly from the bottom up, then the surface that those objects are on have to be flat. Yeah, the rate of disappearance has to relate to our 
So what you're saying is, if it yeah. if it, there's a linear, it's like that um, slide I have up on the live stream with the wind turbines. The fact that it's a linear bottom up obstruction that they describe with a sphere edge means that it's not a squared function. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Yeah, I mean, it, land. yeah, it just takes the sailboat. If the sailboat disappears from the bottom up uniformly, from a, a uniformly within its y axis, then uh, uh, that, it, then the only surface that it can happen uh, that can happen on is a flat surface. Right. How does right. that happen on a curved surface? Yeah, QE had this summarized in a statement which I'll butcher now, which is something along the lines of you can't have linear perspective on a curving surface. It's actually on that slide. So next time it rolls around and you see those turbines that Ranty dig. So I asked Ranty to go out and take a side profile image of some turbines that were claimed to be going over Earth curve. Obviously, they're perfectly flat and level when you take them 90 degrees to the position that they're claimed to be disappearing with perspective. But what you notice in the image is that they're disappearing in a linear fashion. They're getting smaller with linear perspective. Well, you can't have that on a sphere. Uh, that that was like my first discovery with the optical slant even before the black swan exactly that that the concealment rate that's due to optics over distance is linear and it should be exponential if you're standing on a curved surface not exponential. one way or the other it's not exponential it's a squared function yeah that's squared but not linear not linear correct that's the main crux of it sorry to and be it is the distance is like the amount of concealment is equal over the same amount of distances and it stacks up right and so you can get the, and and this is something that they battled with chocolate present in terms of i can't remember it was wiggles or someone like that was out over a barrel when it comes to that function linear that it is occurring pre-earth curve in other words you see a toy boat at the same linear rate of obstruction bottom up that they would claim is earth curve prior to earth curve being a factor well again the linear perspective continues out to any distance and should be a squared function on a globe further to that you've got anthony riley's point which stacked on top of it when we were debating the isle of man which would be there would be both you don't, can't just exclude perspective because you've got a muppet vision mathematical model you still got perspective in reality. Therefore, you have what Anthony Riley described as a double dip. You've got the function of linear perspective plus the squared function of the curved rate descent over the edge of the Earth curve that's been debunked by the black swan. So you've got both. Well, what do you actually have? Well, just the linear perspective that you'd have on a flat plane. That's what we actually have. They've called it Earth curve, but it can't function in the way that it does. And it certainly wouldn't function in the way that it does pre-Earth curve with the exact same effect being observed. I've done my thumbnail. It's uh, Kirk, Spock and McCoy. And McCoy saying, it's no longer a paradox, Captain. There you go. That's my thumbnail. Oh, oh. <laughs> Speaking of which. Go on. Speaking of which. Not even it's dead, yeah, Jim. Well, we're going to get back to the paradoxes, Arwin, but go ahead and then we'll go to John. Just so you get it out of your system. I just want to say, you could make him say... It's dead, Jim, pointing at the paradox, or the word paradox. If you can tell me how I can get a thumbnail to point at a paradox when I've got a stock picture of some of the old 1960s Star Trek crew, then I'm all ears. Good point. It's just that it's dead, Jim, is a classic thing. Damn it, Jim, I'm a flat earther, not a heliocentrist. We don't have the forceps. This clock is dilating. Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not an engineer. <laughs> All right, the faint young sun paradox, okay. or known as the faint young sun problem, describes the apparent contradiction between observation of liquid water early in Earth's history and the astrophysical expectation that the sun's output would only be 70% as intense during the epoch as it was during the modern epoch. The paradox is this. With the young sun's output at only 70% of its current output, early Earth would be expected to completely be completely frozen. But early Earth seems to have liquid water. 
early sphere Earth in the model. Yes. Yes. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't put that in there, did I? <laughs> it's astrophysical. It was implied. Yeah, the term astrophysical implied it. I would. I just want to see where the proof is of all this molten rock that Earth used to be before it cooled down and turned into dirt. So, because that means that every rock that exists ever should have been molten at some point. So it's either yeah. dust and stone or molten. But if I remember there's correctly, there's certain Hold types on. of... Great heavy bombardment. There's a whole narrative about that. So yes, that is part of the story. What? Yes, that's oh, absolutely God. part I of the story. Oh, about them all being molten, about them all being, you know, a great big fire and brimstone mess of things smashing into each other. And then eventually coalescing through gravitational accretion into what we now know as the solar system. And then further to that, once it's been, once the accretion has taken place, you've then got other astrolog uh, astrological events like the moon, pre-moon, Thea, smashing into Earth at a glancing blow, depositing its molten iron core because we should have cooled down already based on their time frame. So again, maybe it was called a paradox at some point, just a plot hole. Hmm. Earth should have cooled down. Well, no. What actually happened was our moon is made up from this planet that smashed into us, depositing its dewy, dewy, juicy, dewy. That's going to get me a uh, copyright. <laughs> <laughs> um, juicy molten iron core in Earth, and therefore it hasn't cooled down because it's extra specially big. Right. Potholes. Okay. But but. If that's all true, and it was all molten and just mashed around like it's some kind of a ball of dough in a kitchen, right? Why are there polonium rings? How did the polonium manage to not degrade within all that molten stone and all that? Exactly. Why didn't... And, and don't Why? even get me started on the adamantium. That's very funny, but polonium rings are actually... I thought Kent Hovind. That's like, exactly, Hovind. that's Kent Hovind. That's right. He came up. He he put, brought that on the table for me. No, Kent Hovind didn't put yeah, adamantium on the table. It was X Men. I don't know why you're doing this. It's actually a very serious argument, but yeah, it's serious. We're talking about the core. <laughs> no, I'm talking about polonium rings, and that they that? how could they have ever formed if if it all originated in a giant ball of molten stone? How could polonium rings have formed? Afterward, after it solidified. Okay, how are polonium rings formed? Arwen? I saw good. Oh, then Alwyn's point might be lost. I saw they manifest, and then they basically start radioactive decay. So, yeah, it had to just come as is. It had to be created exactly as is. Then it started its radioactive decay cycle, which leaves the polonium rings. If it was all molten before that, it could never have formed like that. Because it would have radioactively dispersed way before that. Yeah, it's, just a good, uh, it's, a, it's a not that big a plot hole. No one will notice. The credits will roll. There's, no one will mention it. There's a good recipe for polonium rings on the cooking channel I follow. I thought if I uh, squeezed that joke in, Arwen. Arwen would get angry with me and shout at me, so I didn't. But thank you for dropping the joke in because I wanted to too. Oh, I just want to bring forth a very serious argument, but yeah, you can make all the fun about it you want. We're not making fun it's of you. It's still a very serious argument. We, we're just ignorant of polonium rings, and therefore our ignorance is leading us to jape with your good information. No, I think I, I think when Chocolate said what he said, it's how can it be serious when it's not real? But you're saying from their point of view, it's serious, correct? No, he's saying that there's a phenomenon known as polonium rings. And based on their narrative, they couldn't have developed. So that's a problem, a plot hole, paradox, paradox. Within then, yeah, you got it. Within their narrative, right? Unless maybe pure Polonian at some right, at some point in ancient history, just like Ithia rained down like a, a pure Polonian super meteor, micro meteorite hit the Earth and then penetrated it everywhere in the already cooled down molten rock. So that then the polonium would settle, spread out all over that rock, 
having hit the earth like a micrometeorite uh, on, shower. On, and on. then it Hold would on. Decay. You're just feeding oh, narrative because you're hoping this will get ascribed to you. It's like yes. um, Brahe going, well, it'd have to be enormous. And then it gets ascribed to him, right? Well, Arwin yeah, actually exactly. wants that. <laughs> he wants some heliocentric bullshit ascribed to him. So the polonium rings problem gets written into the narrative as the Arwinian concept of the polonium being developed in the heart of a dying star, being ejected out at supernova stage at a supersonic speed, hurtling its way to Earth, and then the polonium ring develops. Obviously, right. Arwin's narrative in heliocentrism is going to get him named. Right, Arwin? Maybe. No. Oh, I have a question for Arwin. Well, maybe, for but Arwin. maybe in the far, far future, when all of this is forgotten, they will dig this up and then be like, oh my God, that's it. That's that what you really want. This is, this is all it's about. It's just pure vanity for, from Arwin. He wants to be part of the heliocentric model. Ah. Well, I have a question for him then. Let's see if he can answer this. Okay. How do you have, Arwen, how do you have, how do you have uniform uh... You're on mute. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, Arwen, how do you have uniform lateral disappearance in the Z-axis over a consistently curving surface? And thank you for not farting on my stream, uh, Brian. Don't worry about it. What? What does that have to do with polonium? Well, it's a serious question, isn't it? Though? But is it about polonium? Yeah, well, I'm just thinking about it. Hold on, hold on. Just let Brian go. I don't understand the question either, Brian. Can you just explain what you mean? Yeah, I mean, if... if um... Like the polonium, polonium is this the argument more matter? If you can solve this argument, how can you have uniform lateral dis disappearance in the z axis over a consistently curving surface? I have not given it any geometric considerations, really. Can you give it your geometric okay. consideration now, Arwin? I guess that, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, sure, why not? That doesn't answer his question. I, I don't know. Like, is this, like, actually relevant to the effect of polonium decay and all that? Is geometry relevant to that? Well, you'd need your heliocentric version of supernova-produced polonium to fly through a heliocentric system to a sphere earth so yeah pretty crucial pretty crucial are we yeah all right well if you want a story about how that would have happened yes it would have been an exploding star that would have been no, unusually rich in polonium that would it's... basically shower probably a big meteorite went the way to earth then broke up at right to right time fragmented into micro splinters that basically struck the earth like micro needles everywhere absolute bunkum because i know for a fact arwen right that in the early forming earth there were very primitive polonium silicon based life forms that survived in the molten state but when it did solidify they were trapped and that's what leaves these little polonium pockets they're the remnants of the oldest forms of life that's the true fuck? they inhabit us xenu wow. demands it Metallic life form, eh? Yeah, they live mm. in volcanoes. No, they don't. That's just a denial. Uh, if they, it's metallic they're, they're life, Arwen, it's not going to live in do. volcanoes because it's going to melt. Arwen, they you do. can make crystalline life forms and then put it in a condition where it can't actually be crystalline. That the doesn't proof of it is a little polonium. Adam's nonsense. Balls. I want to hear it. Go ahead, Adam. Well, the, the proof of it is exactly what you were describing. I've just described what the cause is. So there's your proof that these, these creatures did exist because they're there in these little polonium deposits. You can still see their traces, their remnants. Their fossils, yeah. you might want to call it. So it's just another branch of lost cousins. No, don't don't ask him a question. We need to ask you this question, Arwin. You know, how can you deny that there would have been these polonium people? I mean, how would you explain the polonium rings without them? Well, I am not against the idea that maybe crystalline life would be able to form... But with metallic crystalline life, that would be extremely difficult in any kind of heat situation because as yep. soon as it's molten, it's not crystalline anymore. But, but, I know this from experience. It's that, it's that mixture of the two that makes them purple polonium people. 
um, why it was. It's just I'm how it sorry, is. but I like I'm not gonna presupposition into complete think, ridi ridicule. No, no, that's I'm fair sorry. enough. No, no, that's reasonable. Owen, but can do you have any evidence against these Polonian people? I mean, can you disprove <laughs> them? Yes. No, you can't. I, I, Yes, I can. Go I on, just man. did it. I just told you if any kind of people, which would be considered life, which would be basically the arrangement and patterns of material, well, that would be crystalline. Well, guess what? Metal cannot be crystalline if it's molten. So that can't work. Yeah, but you no, know, you, no, yeah, hold on. No. He hasn't considered the surface of Thea before the collision, though, has he? The surface oh, of Thea. Screw you with your scattergunning. No, the life forms weren't molten. They existed in the molten state. They were alive in the molten. And what happens when the, it stops being molten and solidifies? They're trapped. And that's what's left. It's just these little polonium pockets, which are the creatures no. that were moving around yeah. in the liquid molten. So no. I've got to be honest. I've heard Owen's bullshit no, is better. No, it's too no, specific. no. Too specific. Owen's bullshit is much this better. This is even. It's vague. This is. This is not even suitable for Star Trek, the original series level of sci-fi. No, 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 no. no. I, I, excuse me, Galactic Lord Xenu. Uh, that's exactly how he did it. If you ask Scientology. I think I think Adam well, should write a series. That's pre-Star Trek, so that's allowed. I think Adam should write a series of books. Uh, this would top Harry Potter any day. This is very petrifying. No, no. Thank uh, you, could all could teach you all a lesson in how to bullshit heliocentric style. Getting hyper specific is not the key to success in heliocentric bullshit you've got to be vague you've got to explain something that's been asked specifically in a vague way you can't get into hyper specific details about little creatures it raises far too many questions you've got to be vague. no it doesn't matter adam had me on the edge he, that was such a great story I, I'd like yeah to that's the problem the it can't seem like a good story because then your brain says, this is a good story. And you go, oh, suddenly the suspension of disbelief fails. What Arwen did was kept it within the narrative without it becoming a, quote, good story. It doesn't need to be a good story. It needs to be enough no, to keep you in the suspension I of disagree. disbelief. Just because it's a, an appealing story doesn't mean it's scientific, it's, right? It there you go, Arwen. 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 See, science isn't exciting stories, is it, Arwen? When Sorry? Adam was... When Adam was talking, my imagination went to pictures. When Arvin was talking, I was I was bored. Perfect. That's that what you need. That you see. It's, it's I know been you think well science guys, is guys. boring. Guys, guys. Tenth just summarised why Arvin's got the better story. Do you want to say that again, Tenth? Because that's why he had the better story. <laughs> well, when Adam was telling the story, my mind saw it in imaginative pictures. When Arvin was talking, I was bored. Yep, much better. Vague, You're all Polonian boring. You make a terrible school student. Yeah, I was a terrible school student. Which is exciting. Well, right? Let's, just do, let's just do a quick comparison. Just a quick comparison. I, I, know, you're all, I know, you're all I know you're all keen. I know you're all keen. Just because Arwin's right, it's not often this is the case. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which is which is better or creates more images in your mind, right? An episode of Star Trek, trouble of trouble with tribbles. With them all multiplying and all the air conditioning ducts and everywhere because somebody's bought one off a planet. Right, if I just tell you that story, you can conjure the images in your mind. Whereas if I show you a black hole from NASA, that's it, by the way. That was the story. Yeah? Yeah. Wh which one's which one's gonna ask raise more questions and lead you into a non-suspension of disbelief in terms of the heliocentric model? Which one's more likely to make you the leave that suspension of disbelief? The black hole, because if it's boring and complicated, then you're more likely to not address it as just a story. You're more likely to ask questions about it and try and figure out a problem that doesn't exist. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with having questions about something that's vague and non-specific. That's great. You know, often the answers that are vague and non-specific are in relation to very specific questions that have been asked. And they're welcomed. But if you've already got answers incorporated into your uh, elusive story, then people start conjuring it as a, a narrative in their mind. And they know it's a story then. You stop suspending disbelief. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I mean, if you got the cool story that, you know, like... If it's got a cool movie attached to it, like I, I, I know how black black holes work because I saw the movie Event Horizon. Exactly. Go through that thing and 
you know, that's that's hell. That's an opening to hell. Thanks for right. Ever Horizon. <laughs> when when Dilly Gill explains what NASA do in there, he describes NASA as being on the cutting edge of cinematography. That's a pretty bold statement made by Dilly Gill. But he also explains how they don't overplay their hand. Keep it nice and simple. Keep it snoozeworthy and boring. So you've got the comparison. Event Horizon, man being spaghettified in his rocket ship that's travelling next to the edge of a black hole. Wow, conjure some pretty vivid imagery, I'm sure you'll all agree. Compare that to, here's our astronaut in zero-g, the most exciting endeavour a man has ever undertaken. What's he doing? He's eating a bit of food out of some foil. Um, can I can I just check, Arwen? Mm -hmm. Are you denying Polonium exists? Of course no. he's not. Band, I like it. I, I'm I'm a goldsmith. I I know things about metal. So hold on, Adam's just being really clever. Go ahead, Adam. But, see, you you aren't a polonium denier, then. Oh, you're not going to do that again, are you? <laughs> Go with it now. Yeah. You're trapped now, Arwin. He's he's going with it. You're tough, tough. Go ahead, Adam. Doesn't it exist? I'm pretty sure it does. So, weren't they there then? I mean, the, 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 the sheer existence of Polonium proves their presence. I've, I've even like, explained to you, you know, in very simple terms, how and why they got there. There's no paradox in my story. You, you've got that clear paradox with your rocks. So, as far as I can see, I don't see why you, you're not accepting the clear evidence in front of you. Well, if you can find some kind of a petrified polonium or pre-polonium people remnant that yeah. would be great yeah what, what, yeah what, the what rings the, the rings table, brother. the rings that's exactly what you brought to the Your, table. A ring is not a person it's not an organism no, no, that's where you're wrong it's a ring shape because it wrong. was millions of years ago that's all that's left of them you don't know what the polonium Before people look like they around. happen well, to be then ring shaped try and Darwin. find a ring that has less decay surrounding it so you could still make out how it was a life form because just a ring is not anything it's just a shape too long ago Arwen Arwen's, Arwen's just well that's too very bad then that you can never prove your theory no you're just close minded to what the Polonian people are like you think they're going to be like torso arms legs head no do you know what they actually were they were ring shaped oh so they were like a virus or something yeah basically yeah. they were like ring shaped so their decayed remnants, I just, that is actually what you're seeing. You know, in fact, Adam was alluding to this being the validation itself, weren't you, Adam? If you would associate that with that form of life, then why would you call it people? Because that's technically not even alive. That form it's of life, that thing. form that's, of life that we're now... just as Hold alive on. as a rock. Sorry, that form of life that we're all now in agreement and assuming together, Correct. Correct. Allegedly. We are all assuming this form of life, aren't we? Allegedly. There you go, Owen. I got a picture of them. That's there you go. Like. There you go. You see them? These are Scandinavian polonium people. No, that's. Go, Adam. Go. Go, Adam. In front of you. It's yeah. not a thing. It is it a is thing. It's not a life. I'll have you, you know. You it up. These were found in Did the he? desert by a small farmer's boy. They reckon, that, they reckon that there was Polonium people, villages, possible, uh, possibly. Oh, okay, possible. I, I oh, want this conversation to end now. This is getting really annoying. <laughs> oh, well, it's your all bad, right. isn't it? You you be bored with all you like. You want that credit on your name with your boring evidence. Well, then it might get there, what but you're the going to have to take some stick in the meantime, Arwin. It's I kept it, it short, and I always quit when everybody's fed up with it. I don't band <laughs> together with eight people to bully an individual for bringing up a concept. Oh, oh here you know, we go. That's typical anti-flat earth tactic. I'm losing, so it's bullying. Losing? <laughs> okay, if you think that Polonian people all of that. Typical is baller. winning, then you go and win with that. Well, the Arwen, Arwen prefaced this argument with the if the heliocentric universe thing. So he's fine, if that were true. But there's another paradox. I only got one left, if y'all want to hear it. 
Well, hang on. Oh, definitely. Yes, please. Yes, yes. Just, yes. A, uh, just real quick. I just did a, I just did a real quick root search. Uh, polygamy comes from the root word polymium. And of course, the ring and marriage, they all go together. So Adam's right. No, polygamy and polygamy. <laughs> They're very different things. It's a bit like celibacy and Shirley Bassey. Very different things. Well, that's what it said. Right, right. That... See, two great proofs, one from Tim, one from Nathan, uh, uh, to just demonstrate how right I am. Exactly. Nathan. Semantical proof. It's not actual. Uh, yeah. No, those are proof. physical rings. No, they are, they denying... are real. Hold on. Owen is you... going to be a polonium denier. He's denying them, Adam. He's denying them. Is he denying <laughs> that in the vows of marriage, people put rings on? What? But there, Owen. Are you it's denying right what was he is? He's screen? denying them, Adam. He's denying them. I heard him. I, I heard him. It. That's not a person. Not anymore. Not anymore. Not ever. Obviously. If it was, no, if we've there already was any ever a person, there should be something. Some uh, print, Arwen, anything. Arwen, Arwen, let me put it back on screen and I'll show you a, a little family unit that used to exist back in the day lot. Yeah, but that's not polonium, though. It was, um, it's a polonium hybrid. Mum, Dad, two children, look. Polly and Peter. And then here, this is the granddad, because they're off to see him. This is how they used to get habit, yeah? You see these kind of shapes, these family units, all through the rock deposits. No. It's indicative that they Sometimes were... It, they no, but you're wrong. Poetry. You're, you're mechanically indicative. wrong. You see, that's Sometimes. not polonium. That's the halo... That's left by the act radioactive decay of polonium. Spot on, no, exactly. Because exactly. they're obviously dead and fossilized, so it's all that's left. But it's it's what we can understand of how they functioned and lived. It's obvious. Uh, Manny, Adam, Manny of the household. Hold on. It's hold obvious. On. Adam hold is on. right because. Yeah, but that's trying to look, determine a, a race of look, a people uh, Arwen, by hold their Owen, Owen, Owen. We've got tenth who wants to get pun in. Brian, who wants to get a point in, and John, who's actually developed this entire conversation, wants to get his last paradox in. So who's first? I'll go first. The angle of attack that Adam is taking on this historical fact proves it's true. Look at those straight lines. No, it didn't. Okay, Brian, go no, ahead. No, that's trying to determine yeah, the race of people by their campfires. That's exactly uh, yeah. what Look, Adam I don't want to hear your hand waves nonsense. dismissal, Arwin. Go ahead, Brian. Screw yeah, you, Nathan. Nathan. How dare you misapply... Academic. That's about your feelings. Look, let, oh, hold on, Brian. Let Arwen get his feigned exasperation out, like we're not role playing here or anything. Don't, don't damn well misapply academics just for a joke, right? If you're going to apply the academics very seriously on something that's very frivolous, that's one thing. But don't misapply it, not even for a joke. That's yeah. just straight out confusion. Totally agree, Adam. What an outrage. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. There, there, there is there is good evidence that suggests that there were uh, that a lot of the families had polonium dogs and cats. Also, that wasn't worth it at all. Olber's paradox, the photometric paradox. Are you denying polonium dogs? Oh no, it's not going to end. Go on, Brian. <laughs> Well, are you denying polonium dogs? That, and yeah, we've already the, let that little jape go, haven't wrong. we, Brian? We've already used that, though, haven't we? Did we? I didn't hear it. Oh, I didn't yeah. hear anyone. No, I, yeah. I think Brian has a point. There was animal polonium life as well. Oh, you're going to jump on this bandwagon now, are you? Uh, well, if, if there... If Why don't you Adam, write a novel about it, Dan? Uh, that's what I said. Adam should write a book and make a movie out of it. The whole point is Adam already put the evidence there. No. And if there's people, there's animals with people. No, it's far too exciting. As I said at the beginning, our wind is much better. Yeah. Go on, John. I hope no one will Polonium denies. <laughs> okay. if, if the Old story's Bruce too Paradox. exciting, they're going to catch on and they're not going to have it stuck to their subconscious for yes, the thank rest you. of their thank life. Thank you for reiterating my point. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> one last try. Yeah. I can't, I can't do it. I'm giggling too much. Uh, Olber's paradox, the photometric paradox. In accordance with the classical model of the universe, static and infinite, filled with evenly distributed stars, the brightness of the stars should evenly illuminate the entire universe. It is well known that the night sky is dark, but according to the classical model, it should be 
no less bright than the brightness of the evenly arranged stars. In other words, why is there any darkness if we're surrounded by stars? That's a good one, Well, uh, you get rid of it. It's a classic model. That's the Rephrase it. Not the stars, but the giant suns, which is what it's supposed to be. Exactly. In yeah, Arwen's got down to the physicality assumption bias that leaves them with a paradox in their model that isn't necessary to assume when you just look up at lights in the sky. Right on, Arwen. You're on fire today. Yeah, it's still built on R. And <laughs> I thought I covered that when I said line. stars. <laughs> just that's, that's what the sun is supposed to be, right? A star. Exactly, in a chocolate. Like, Why isn't it a red dwarf? Just trying to see to the sun, right? The sun gives us the, the potential option in our mind that it might be this giant fiery ball, right? Because it's so bright and it's pretty big. Like we can make out how big it is with our eyes. Stars, not so much. They had to convince us that the stars were just like the sun, really big, but just far away. So it's the other way around. I can cover the, th the sun with my thumb at arm's length. It's not very big. I don't see how any of these things are paradoxes. They're not. None of them are. They didn't. They weren't paradoxes because they're right. based on an assumption of the physicality of a model that's been reified. So none of them were paradoxes in reality. In the model, they might be paradoxes. A paradox within the model isn't really a paradox. It's like saying, "How do you cope with the problem of the burning lamp in Narnia when it's got no gas line?" That's a paradox. No, no, it isn't. No, no. It's a plot hole. They're just plot holes, not paradoxes. Yeah. Well, to a heliocentrist. Uh, I, story error. A dead end. Uh, and I'd just like to point out, so I'd just like to point out, that, sorry, John, I'd just like to point out that Baldwin did matter my very pertinent question. What? What? Yeah, Baldwin didn't answer my very pertinent question. I asked Baldwin a very pertinent question. And he just said, ah, yeah, whatever. That's all he got. All it's because we were talking about polonium remember. and you were asking about the, the the squaring function versus the linear perspective, right? Yeah. But well, that, that had nothing to the polonium. I don't get it. I didn't understand the question and its relation to what we were talking about. It had everything to do with... The, the question, because the question, what you are talking about is based within a model. So I asked you a question from reality, and you, you had to avoid it, because you're a lawyer. Well, see, uh, Ar Arwen actually won no, that point. Because you can't he, ask he a question it. about reality when we're talking about a concept. That doesn't make sense. That's not fair, Brian. He's only talking about a reified <laughs> concept, after all. He, he, he did a disclaimer at the beginning when he said, if this is true within the model. He said it at the very beginning, so you have to make the question with him. <laughs> See, John understands the rules. I love that, by the way, John. Thank you very much for giving us all of that. That was um, a whole show's worth of stuff. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I just started thinking about like all the paradoxes I used to believe, you know, or used to think were paradoxes when I was a heliocentrist. And I was like, well, you can throw all that out the window. It's not a paradox anymore, you know? Indeed. Well, I concluded when I was very young and still in school on a philosophical note that thinking about paradoxes, that wait, a paradox can only be conceptual because something that cannot exist because of some consistency cannot exist. In other words, paradoxes it, can't actually exist. What about uh, dualities? Dualities concepts? Yeah, it violates the law of non-contradiction. That's right, Arwen. If you've got a paradox, yeah. i.e. A causes B and A simultaneously doesn't cause B, that's a paradox, right? Well, that can't exist in reality. That's what Arwen's saying. Exactly, and I concluded that very young before I knew what was what even. So. Therefore, if there's a paradox within the model or description of reality in this instance, reified, then that's not real. It can't be because it has a paradox in it. Exactly. But that's the only reason you have a paradox because you have something that you have an explanation for, but that explanation doesn't work. 
that's why it's a paradox. Like what's the word fellow? What does the word fellowship mean? Of the ring? <laughs> yeah, that's very good. What is the, the okay. Is it Campolonium? Uh, is it a boat with a load of boat with a load of wise guys on it? Hang on. Can Polonium have a fellowship? Nobody like my boat with a load of wise guys on it, joke. Fair enough. <laughs> if Polonium had, yeah. had a spirit, yes. <laughs> if well, anybody Adam, reacted, I would have said, well, it's a good fellowship, but nobody did. Uh, what was that? Concepts exist uh, in nature on their own. I got proof of it in Master B. Polonium International Doctoral Fellowships. There you go, Adam. What? What is what? that? <laughs> what? God flashing again, isn't it? The nonsensical story within the model that's been debunked. Is are we, are we going back to that? No, we'll round out in a moment. It was a good show, though. No, it was, it was fun doing what they do to society, just make up stuff. Yeah, I had fun today, mostly thanks to Adam. Didn't make anything up. Well, the, uh, no, best I didn't part say of you were. I'm saying they did. They even the, best part of it is, yeah, the best part of it is you have two different sides arguing the same uh, within the same uh, model so that you win either way you go. And that's really what they do. With that, I'm going to say another huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. And of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premier Ring streams. For hopefully, smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, hitting the PayPal link, and all that good stuff. Also, below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. And this is a particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I will see you all in the next video.